Hello. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Sunday, August 23rd, and despite the smoke out my window, the fires that have shut down our warehouse and our store, we are live today. That means we slept last night. Now tonight's a whole nother story since we have a whole bunch of lightning coming in. So I thought I would come on, see what I could do to do a support group meeting while we can because it is a dynamic situation. Hello, YouTube. Hi, Ruth. Hi, Melanie. Hi, Heidi. I know I'm here. I'm here. It's crazy. Hello, Artie. Hi, Joan. Joan, because we're, we're, we're dealing with massive fires right now. And my, uh, I mean, they're huge. And I'm in between two big ones, just like last year. And our warehouse is closed. We will not be shipping tomorrow, I do not believe, because of fire. In fact, I have pictures. <laughs> Here, hold on a sec. Let me see if I can get them. Uh, let's see here. Uh, here we go. Let's let this picture. So this is a satellite picture of the fire as it stands, the, the fire that's closest to us. So all the red spots are active fire. So the city right here is Healdsburg, right? Sorry about the, it's, it's hard to, so all the red spots right now are active. So you can see right here, it's starting to burn into the town of Windsor right here. And so this is, everything is evacuated up to the highway. And then our warehouse for the IC network is actually up here in this valley. And so um, all that's mandatory evacuation, whoops. And then you can see the big edge is, is heading towards the ocean. And then the Southern edge, whoops, hold on. The Southern edge is, that's where they're, this might be a smaller picture, if you can see that. Um, the smaller picture, I mean the, um, the bottom edge right here is starting to burn into the Russian River community, uh, Guerneville, that's all been evacuated for a couple of days. And so to give you a clue, so my sister lives uh, right about here, right? There's lakes, that's Lake Sonoma right here. So our, our warehouse is, is up here where we do all of our shipping for the IC network. And then to give you a clue, you can see we had another fire out on the ocean, but they got that one. We've got a fire down here on Point Reyes. That's only 2,000 acres. Oh, look at that. There's a new fire. Where the hell's that? Oh, okay, that's down in Marin County. Um, and then the really big, 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 big fire is this one. This one is like 250,000 acres. Um, and that's the one that started burning into the town of Vacaville and got all the way into the Central Valley. So these were all started by lightning last weekend. And if you could see, I don't know if I can, let me see if I can turn this. You can't really see out my window. It's orange because that's all smoke. Um, it's stink. And, and see the challenge here is this, this isn't just a grass fire, this is a forest fire. This is going into Armstrong Grove, the big old redwoods. I mean, this is just a, normally we're not in fire seat. You know, we don't, we are at this point until October. The fact that it's in August, we're exhausted. <laughs> that just, you know, I mean, like literally I haven't slept a full night in a week and now we have new lightning coming in tonight. So please, please God, Please, 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 please don't let it start any more fires. We need some sanity here. Otherwise, I'm going to be putting a call out to you guys saying, hey, anybody got room anywhere? <laughs> if, you, 
Anybody who wants to live in California right now, it's just not fun. It's just not fun at all. So anyway, um, uh, for people who are asking how we're doing, uh, we have fires, lots and lots of fires, and it's impacting all of our day, uh, all of our daily lives right now. We just can't do a lot. We can't go walking. You can't, you know, if you're evacuated, you're evacuated. Even my best friend evacuated today, and she doesn't even need to evacuate. <laughs> She's just, uh, she's just afraid. She just has a lot of anxiety. And so anyway, all right. So not that this is, I want to thank you as an IC support group leader for you guys giving me support because the support group leaders need just as much support as everybody else. And this is indeed a very, very difficult time for us. Also want to take a moment and thank our sponsor for these meetings, Preleaf done by DSC Healthcare Solutions. Prelief is the oldest supplement that has been used by IC patients. It helps to reduce acid. So if you're gonna eat something that it could be a little bit risky, and I'm telling you right now, my whole stomach is quite tender right now from the stress. So if you're gonna do something, eat something that can be a little bit on the acidic side, you can take a prelief beforehand and that will reduce some of the acid so that it won't quite be so much, quite so irritating. So we want to thank DSC Healthcare Solutions for sponsoring. Um, Preleaf has been around for so long. And uh, the thing I, I just love about uh, the two companies that have had this, AK Pharma and now DSC Healthcare Solutions, is that they really care. I mean, you know, I mean, there's obviously there are companies that are trying to make a buck and you know, it's a dime a dozen, they have what they do, and you never know where the ingredients are from and anything like that. And, and I just have to say that the companies that I have worked with in the IC community, they're very thoughtful and caring, they, they, usually because the, someone that they know or they themselves were impacted in some way by IC. And so they're putting their money where their mouth is. And I think that that's really wonderful. So again, if you're gonna be eating something that's risky, there you go. Now, um, uh, uh, let me just introduce myself. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. And I don't know why I'm looking over to the side like this. I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm the longest serving IC support group leader in the United States. I'm the national IC support group leader. This is a national and international IC support group meeting. I normally do them on Sundays, except fire season makes it hard. Um, my purpose in doing these meetings is to make you so strong, so knowledgeable, and so informed that no one can mess with you again. That no one can mess with you again. Uh, if somebody has the audacity to tell you that IC is all in your head or that, that you're making this up, I want to give you so much information that you can pound them down with facts, with science. We believe in science here in the IC network. I believe in science. We use science to make our decisions. Um, and so anyway, when I do these meetings, I normally do kind of 30 minutes to an hour of a lecture. And then I uh, will take your questions and then we will do a Zoom meeting where you can ask your questions. Of course, this all depends upon power. If I disappear suddenly, it means they've turned our power off to prevent fires. So don't freak out if I disappear. Also, um, please understand that if you place an order with the IC network on Thursday, Friday, uh, we cannot ship it out right now. And we are telling everybody we can't, we are evacuated. My staff is evacuated. We, we cannot do it. So we will be sending out orders when we can, hopefully middle of the week. With any luck, it'll be tomorrow. Maybe we'll see, but we don't even know if the post office is going to be open at this point in time. So it's that serious. So this is what I want to talk about today. Um, I, we're just finishing up our summer, our late summer magazine. And I did, um, you know, normally in the summertime, that's when we review all the new research that was presented at the American Urology Association conference. And um, uh, this year there was no conference. They canceled it for COVID. However, they did an online conference and the online conference was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And I wanted to go over uh, a couple of this with you. And so hold on a sec. Um, I, 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 I think that this is really, really important stuff. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about was a lecture 
that was given by Dr. Curtis Nickel. And Curtis Nickel is the top IC doctor in Canada. And he's a brilliant writer. I like read everything he, he writes. Uh, he was part of an early subtyping system. He, they used a system called U-Point or Input in Canada. He was the president of the Canadian Urology Association, been involved with IC ever since I've been involved with IC, probably 30 years. And um, one of the things that I have talked about consistently is next generation testing. You know, next generation urine testing, DNA urine testing, um, and how we have multiple research studies now that prove that typical urine cultures are just not that good, that they miss 70, 80, 90 percent of the potential bacteria that can be grown, that can be in your urine. Um, oh, here, hold on a sec. Wait, I just got a message from somebody. Hold on. It's a fire message. Give me a quick moment. Okay. 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 Everything's fine. <laughs> I got, I got to be on top of this. Just so you got to understand. I got to be on top of this. All right. So uh, what was I saying? So we know that next generation DNA urine testing is solid. We know that we have the research to prove it. And yet so many of you have asked for it and your doctors have said, no, your doctors have said it's hooey. Your doctors have said they don't believe it. But guess what? Curtis Nickel gave the most fantastic lecture called The Impact on the, of the Microbiome on Urinary Disease at the American Urology Association. And I just wanted to read part of it to you because I think that you will find this fascinating. And this is, part, this is part of the article that's in our magazine that, that will be coming out hopefully in 10 days. Um, so a renowned IC researcher, Dr. Curtis Nickel was given the honor of giving the John K. Latimer lecture to the AUH general session where it has been viewed by thousands of urologists around the world. He introduced the importance of beneficial bacteria in the urinary tract and just how dangerous and disruptive antibiotic therapy can be. He said, you are your microbiome. While it may only weigh three to four pounds, your body has more microbial cells than human cells and more microbial diversity than your genetics. You exist as a vessel, albeit a fragile vessel that provides a world for your personal microbiome population. The biome keeps us alive. And for anybody who doesn't know what the biome is, that, those are the, listen, we are filled with bacteria and fungi and viruses. You know, we are, we are uh, uh, a host uh, to many, many, many tens of thousands, millions and millions of beneficial bacteria and potentially pathological bacteria. And beneficial bacteria play really, really important roles in our health. Beneficial bacteria, for example, in your gut produce the food that the cells that line your bowel eat. The human body does not make this food. The human body does not make this food. We have to have good bacteria. There was a really, really interesting documentary a couple years ago where they were looking at the food, and, and this is off the lecture, but I just wanna explain this. Um, they, were, they were trying to understand what good food was. And so they went back to the most important food of all, which was mother's milk. And they started analyzing mother's milk. And what they found was that the great majority of mother's milk does nothing for the human body. What it does is it feeds the bacteria. It's filled with prebiotics. And so when you're nursing your child, you're thinking that you're, you're nourishing your child, but you're actually also nourishing the beneficial bacteria that live in the gut of your child. You're giving them a chance to have a good healthy, normal biome. Fascinating, right? I mean, it's really, really interesting. All right, so the biome keeps us alive. They are allies that support your health. They assure balance, homeostasis, genetics, digestion. They control your mood and your energy level. 
But tragically, the use of antibiotics is now placing great pressure on the biome and is causing dysbiosis or an ecological imbalance in the human body. While the urinary tract was long thought to be sterile and was surprisingly left out of the Human Microbiome Project, new state-of-the-art next-generation DNA sequencing has changed that perception. He said, the bladder and to the lesser extent, the prostate and the kidneys are a veritable microbial jung jungles. The first study released in 2019 found 330 bacteria associated with infection in the urinary tract. Microgen Diagnostics gave him access to the data of 70,000 urine specimens, revealing more than 4,000 species of bacteria in our urine. But unfortunately, they aren't sure what a normal urinary microbiome is because antibiotics has long changed our biome. But he believes it is very diverse and that there are clear differences between men and women. In fact, the MAP Research Network found extreme diversity between genders, ages, and hormonal status. So when you're young, you might have a completely different biome than when you're older. They are continuing that work with a new study that will follow 600 subjects. But researchers Alan Wolf and Elizabeth Muller at Loyola also found differences between the microbiota found in voided urine, catheterized urine, the urethra, and the periurethra. So where it's sampled is also important. He also shared that they had discovered definite fungus, fungal presence, in the, uh, in the urinary tract, which they call the mycobiome, as well as viruses, which they call the virome in the urinary tract. Icy flares were more painful in patients who had more fungal species found in their urine. Dr. Nickel had hoped that research would reveal a hidden pathogen like H. pylori found in stomach ulcers that eventually led to a Nobel Prize. But in the MAP studies, there, were no, there was no clear pathogen, but there were clear differences between men with chronic prostatitis and those without. In one bacteria in that group called Burkholderia senosepacea, emerged as a possible subject for infection in chronic prostatitis, but they found 78 species. IC studies found 97 species in our urine, and there was one candidate organism that they want to study a little bit more called Lactobacillus gasseri, G-A-S-S-E-R-I. And at this year's AUA, the biome found in Hunter's lesions was released. Um, anyway, uh, they, they were released, but when I read this study, it just didn't make sense. So I can't really talk about that more. They even found differences in the biome with incontinence. Uh, men with lower urinary tract symptoms had differences in the biome. Another thing that I've talked about before, kidney stones. We know that kidney stones are covered with bacterial bio, biofilms. People who are deficient in one species of bacteria called Oxalobacter formigens are more at risk of stone development. Apparently, this bacteria helps to metabolize calcium oxalates. When it is missing, stones develop. When it is present, the risk of developing stones is reduced by 70%, 70, 70%. Dr. Nichol said, Dysbiosis imbalance in the gut and urine and in the stone leads to urinary stone disease. And they've also found that bladder and prostate cancer may be linked to a dysregulation caused by dysbiosis re resulting in an environment that can promote tumor growth. Okay, so how can we care for our biome? How do we care for our biome? Number one, Dr. Nichols said we have to eat better. We have to exercise more. We have to stay away from antibiotics and avoid environmental pollutants to support our microbial buddies. Fecal transplant is viable because it introduces good bacteria to protect patients from having a UTI. Urine transplant, we were talking about this last year, the transplant of healthy urine may 
also protect against urinary tract infection by recolonizing the bladder with healthy non-pathogenic bacteria from a healthy host. He said that this shows great promise, especially in patients with a neurogenic bladder. And one of the most exciting things under development is a sublingual vaccine that confers innate and adaptive immunity to the bladder mucosa for patients with recurring urinary tract infections. The European clinical trial is complete, but the data has not been published yet. It provides immunity against Klebsiella. How many of you have had positive Klebsiella? E. coli, Proteus, and Enterococcus. And he concluded by saying, um, doctors should start with next generation testing instead of urine cultures. He said, interpreting the data for next generation testing is difficult, but studies are now attesting to the benefits and pitfalls of this approach. He said, quote, I predict it will not be long before we abandon the Petri dish for the PCR test, the Petri dish meaning the urine culture test. Now, guys, this is fantastic. I mean, seriously, this is Think about how far we have come. 20 years ago, everybody thought urine was sterile. 20 years ago, everybody thought if you had symptoms of frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, you had infection. And now we know, number one, urine is not sterile. Number one, we know urine is, the, our biome is a robust, diverse, heterogeneous, for lack of a better term, population of good bacteria and bad bacteria, well, good bacteria, fungi, and viruses with the occasional infection caused by a pathogenic bacteria. And remember, you know, it's kind of a biological war. You've got a lot of good bacteria to keep the bad bacteria in check, right? And so you've got good bacteria to keep fungus in check. And so it is only in our best interest to keep our biome healthy. And this is where, you know, number one, the use of antibiotics is so devastating. It's like taking a for it's like taking a, a flamethrower to a tropical forest, it kills everything. And here's the problem is you need the good bacteria, you need the good bacteria. And so when you take antibiotics for a long period of time, you are then forced with having to repopulate your body and it will never be the way it was before, you know, that it's, it's a delicate balance. And we, as much as we want to think as humans, we know everything, we know nothing really about the intricacies of how our biome keeps us healthy. We have good bacteria in our brain, my friends, you know, uh, we have biofilms in our brain. They're supposed to be there. And if you take a biofilm buster, I was reading one study, you take a biofilm buster and you accidentally break open some of these infections and allow, uh, and allow it to change, you've destroyed the environment. You've destroyed the normal, levels of the normal level of checks and balances that our body relies on to be alive. The other thing is that we now very clearly understand that fungus is playing a role two. It's playing a big role in our potential symptoms. So if there's ever, if there's one group of patients who's been massively overexposed to antibiotics, it's you and me. It's the lower urinary tract patients. I mean, seriously, when I was a kid, I remember being given 16 sulfas to swallow at one time. I mean, like I was literally in the doctor's office doing this. Um, the damage that that must have done is, is nothing short of astonishing. And so in the future now, what are we going to do? They're probably going to be treating urinary tract infections, not with an antibiotic, but with bacteria, good bacteria to kill the bad bacteria, also in the form of a urine transplant or a vaccine or something like that. So it's wonderful. It's wonderful. 
I will tell you that I did uh, antibiotics for six months, uh, augmentin, amoxicillin under the Dr. Fugazada protocol. Did nothing for me. Um, this was back in the 90s. Um, uh, what it did give me was a drug resistant candida labrata infection that I had for two years. I will tell you the pain from that fungal infection in my urine was nothing short of astonishing. It was so much worse than my typical IC. And it took two years to kill it. It took a lot of diflucan, a lot of dietary changes to kill that MF, you know, it was rough. So anyway, here we've got one of the top doctors in the world supporting the use of next generation urine testing and predicting that every urologist will be using this in a couple of years. I think it's great news. It's great news because when you have a urine culture and they test for bacteria, guess what? They're not looking for fungus. And we now know from our own National Institute that, uh, Institutes of Health that many of us have fungal infections or have had fungal infections. And in fact, many, many people in flares have an active fungal infection. And you know, here you've got all the symptoms, frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. You're like going, what? It's gotta be infection. The problem is, is they're not looking for the right infection. They're not looking for the right infection. So anyway, that was one really big thing. See, look at this. I always start, I always start sweating whenever I do these. It's crazy. Well, it is hot outside and I do have a big hot light on me. All right. So anyway, that was one. And I thought maybe I would go through a couple of more, but let me just uh, check in here real quick. Andrea says, thank you for the free bottle of allopath. Awesome. Glad you got it. I have a couple more bottles of allopath to give away. I also want to say that on um, a couple of you have sent emails wanting for back issues with the IC network and I lost your emails and there was a man who asked for some and I can't find it. I still have a lot more old um, magazines that I'm sending in groups to people. I don't want to recycle them. It's like there's good information in there. So if any of you want a packet of our magazine, the IC Optimist, um, some of the older issues. All you have to do is email me your snail mail address to icnetwork at mac.com and I would be more than happy to send them to you. Lisa, smoke can flare IC too. Yeah, I can smell it coming in the window. See, I've got the air conditioner here. I can, I can smell it coming in, it is bad. Kristen, thank you. Lynn, thank you. Lynn says we have family in Healdsburg and they are on standby. Yeah. Lynn, so we're out on Dry Creek Road. Kristen is in Iceland. She's been flaring lately since I took a one day road trip where the bows were really bumpy. Could that be the reason I feel burning pain? Yeah, hon. That's what we call a travel induced flare. That's a pelvic floor induced flare. Uh, when you have a flare after a long car ride or after intimacy or sitting for a long period of time, we're really looking at a pelvic floor flare. So you want to do things that will try to relax your pelvic floor muscles. Suzanne says prayers from Grass Valley, Nevada City. I know you guys, you guys are in it too. Brenda says I'm here in Sirius and the sky has been orange for the last four to five days. Lee says, I wish I could teleport you to Canada. Girl, I would love to come to Canada, except you guys have a lot of fires, too. Um, hi, Gina. Hi, Ruth. Hi, Lee. Hi, Dottie. Dottie says she loves pre-leave. Awesome. Jennifer says the depression from this disease is debilitating. You know, it can be. It can be. And, and you know, Jennifer, if you're finding that you're struggling with depression, uh, you definitely want to, number one, let your doctor know uh, um, because there may be some medication that might be a little bit more helpful, not only for, for the depression, but for potentially calming your nerves down by your bladder, a.k.a. amitriptyline. Um, but having somebody to talk to is really, really important here. And so if you've got a family member or a friend or, a, um, you know, a minister or a therapist, somebody that you can just let it out. You know, you know. sometimes working with IC patients, I have to say that for some of you, and I could say something else, what happens, and, and, and the, o the only way I can describe it is that it's like you're spinning in a circle, you, you know, with anxiety. It's just like, you can't stop. It's just, 
it's just pain, sad, pain, sad, over, 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 over again. And, and then we start seeing a lot of catastrophizing. It's like, oh, it's a flare. It'll never go away. Oh, I'll be this the rest of my life. Oh, no, no, no. My life is over. Oh, nobody will love me. You know, you get stuck in this really awful cycle of catastrophizing that just makes it so much worse. Amen. Been there. <laughs> yeah, been there. And so on um, a big part of, of trying to find your feet again and, and getting get on solid ground again, it's learning how to control the anxiety. I have a video of that on our website, icnetwork.org. Um, anxiety is driven by adrenaline. It's driven by adrenaline. And so whenever you have a negative thought, you get a boost of adrenaline into your bloodstream. But the problem is, is that you're having negative thought after negative thought. You're having 10 negative thoughts every 10 minutes. That's 10 jolts of adrenaline, which are now amping everything up. Now your heart is starting to race. Your brain is kind of cycling in, in fear. Um, and so the secret really is learning how to bring the adrenaline levels down. When the adrenaline levels drop, you get more control. You feel calmer. You feel more collected and more hopeful. So I'll give you the secret that I use. This is what I was taught in a class years ago, and it completely changed my life. And right now I'm doing it every day again because of the fires. Okay. So whenever you have a negative thought, the first thing you do is just close your eyes for a moment and visualize a stop sign. Just like stop, stop your brain, stop everything. Just close your eyes, stop sign. Then take a nice, slow, deep breath in for three, out for three. Let's do it again. In for three, out for three. So what happens chemically, biochemically in your bloodstream is that oxygen turns off that adrenaline. It renders it chemically neutral. So in the program, whenever you have a negative thought, it's about stop sign, deep breath. And then most importantly, you got to minimize the thought. You know, what I say to myself is, oh, my God, Jill, you're not God. You can't predict the future. How arrogant can you, can you possibly be to think that you know what's going to happen in a week? Right. You have to have something to say to yourself that kind of reminds you it's a thought. It's really it's just a thought. And I've asked a lot of the doctors who have come into our lectures, they said, why do we do that? Why? I mean, I'm a very optimistic person. For anybody who's talked to me, you know, I'm extremely optimistic. My magazine is called The IC Optimist. And yet I, too, had struggle with negative thoughts. And it's, um, it's, a, it's about biochemistry in the brain. Um, and that it's just kind of easier some, in, in some way. And I can't give the exact explanation. So learning how to control your anxiety, reducing the level of negative thinking, reducing the, catast the catastrophizing is critically important. This is what we know from IC research studies. Patients who are catastrophizing do worse. They do worse. Patients who are, have got the catastrophizing down do much, much better. So there is some skill building here that you've got to do. Listen, God didn't give us the skills to deal with IC when we were born. We have to learn them. And there's no shame in learning from them. And there's no shame in asking for help to learn them. That's why I took the class. I was having panic attacks going to the doctor. I was 33. And I just, just one day I was like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. Enough. I don't want to panic going to the doctor. And so I signed up for this class that totally changed my life called phobies. I haven't had a panic attack since I took the class, you know? And so think about that. Think about that. Linda says, is allopath as good as aloe vera? It's different. It's different. It is a, it is a aloe with a pain fighter. And so it is a more comprehensive, robust formula than traditional aloe. Oh, good. You So you received your first bottle. That's great. Oh, I, in my opinion, I think it's just as good, if not better, because it's doing more. It's doing more. 
Lindsay says, I cut out all sugars, grains, carbonated drinks, and caffeine, night and day difference. I also take Candex daily. So, Lindsay, I do believe, if I remember correctly, there was an issue with taking Candex long term. So do not exceed the manufacturer's instructions on that. I don't remember what that was, but I think it was related to Candex. Hi, Sherry. Cindy says, are there any supplements that relax the muscles for those of us with pelvic pelvic things. Um, I believe, Cindy, you you would look for something with a little bit of magnesium in it. I think it's the magnesium that provides a muscle relaxation formula. And I think in most of the natural approach nutrition products, they have a, the little, a little bit of magnesium in there, but there's no substitute for pelvic floor physical therapy. Listen, and now look, you guys, I have my new favorite toy. Like my new favorite, my my new favorite toy is oh oh god oh wait hold on my levators just fell off. <laughs> so I got I decided to get this model. All right, so we have we have our our new model of the pelvis because I wanted you to be able to see you know how small this area is right, and so here's. If you look at the, well, no, hold on. If we turn it around, this also gives you an idea of the depth of the muscles. Because if we look at it from the bottom, these are, these are your levator muscles. So the lowest muscle are your levator muscles are the muscles that are really associated with your urethral pain. If you're having trouble emptying your bladder, if you're constipated, things like that. And then above that, we have... Uh, a whole nother set of muscles, uh, piriformis muscles and things like that. Wait, hold on. Oh gosh. You would think that I would be good with this, but anyway, so I want you to, so getting back to your question about is a supplement good for muscle relaxing? Not as good as, not as good as somebody actually rubbing the muscle. Right. And that's what they do. And Right. So they will put their finger in your vagina and then they will gently rub along the length of just, just exactly like I'm doing it right now. This is what they do. Right. Or they might go across. And you the thing is, is that when you have a muscle knot, when you have a muscle knot, what do you normally do? You rub it out. You rub it out. A pill won't magically make a trigger point release. A finger on the trigger point, whoops, hold on. This is the way you, the best way to work with the pelvic floor. Isn't that cool? And you know, what's so interesting is that, you know, this is it's still a very small area. And so when a pelvic floor physical therapist works with you, they're actually gonna be rubbing along your bone, right? So they can actually reach this far. It's so interesting. Brenda says she's been down for three weeks with pelvic pain. I'm sorry to hear that, Brenda. What's going on? Ah, Lee says, ah, yes, I did microgen. Melanie says, my IC is out of control and I'm in severe pain, having to use an ice pack to even get some sleep. Melanie, tell us about the pain. What kind of flare are you having? Is it a bladder wall flare, or a pelvic floor flare, or a nerve flare? Sarah said, uh, did each subject also have blood in their urine? Uh, uh, I don't think so. Lee says, my Canadian doctor scoffed at my a microgen. Well, you'll have to tell them that the, you'll have to tell them that the former president of the Canadian Association is the one who gave the freaking lecture supporting it. Lee says, oh my God, I have Labrata. Yeah, Labrata, Candida Labrata is notorious for being the most drug resistant of the candidas. 
Brenda, Brenda says, after 10 years of IC, you finally come to know your IC pretty well and can keep your bladder happy, but now you're having pelvic pain. This is a whole new monster. I don't know how to deal. It had taken my, okay. So girl, what's, the, so remember you're an anatomical mystery to be solved. So what we need to know is what structure, what structure in this pelvis, and remember, remember how, now, now, this is always a bit of a comedy, you know, think it. So here, look at this small area. So, oh, wait, hold on. I got to put the levators back on. Okay, so hold on. The, the levator is on. Okay, so now that I have the levators on, so we have to put the reproductive in, tract in. So, whoop, okay, let, come on, come on, let, oh, come on. Get in there. It's really a brilliant sign. So, so, so look, so now we have filled up this space with the uterus and the vagina. And now we have to put in the bladder, right? And then you have the bowel, which goes right in there too, right? And this shows you what a small confined area this is and why you literally, literally have to focus on your anatomy first. We've got to what do I always say? Don't walk into a doctor and say, you've got IC. For God's sake, don't do that. Walk into your doctor's office and describe your symptoms. And then you ask, what in my pelvis can cause this symptom? If you've got a, if you've got a, a slight arousal sensation that's combined with pain, we know what that is. That's an entrapped pudental nerve. If you feel a buzzing sensation, like you're sitting on a cell phone on vibrate, we know what that is. That is an entrapped pelvic nerve. If you have pain after you're done using uh, the bathroom, we know what that is. That's the pelvic floor. If you have pain as your bladder fills with urine that is relieved with urination, we know what that is. That's your bladder wall. And we gotta figure out what the hell's wrong with your bladder wall. There can be a lot of things. It could be estrogen atrophy. It could be chemical irritation. It could be chronic fungal infection, chronic viral infection, chronic bacterial infection. Emily says, Jill, there is an irony here. You're always helping us with fires in our bodies. I would like to extend my deep sympathy for the fire in your environment and the stress is now causing. Thank you. <sighs> this is my happy face. <laughs> you haven't seen my sad, upset face yet. We'll see. We'll see how it is tomorrow. Be up all night tonight, I'm sure. Carla says, I'm here on the tip of Africa in, Namib in Namibia and was diagnosed a couple of weeks ago. The meds my urologist prescribed is not available in my country, and he says that it is best and doesn't really know what else to give me. So, so, so you can import it from South Africa, but it will cost an arm and a leg. Okay, hon, that's Elmeron pentosin polysulfate, and pentosin polysulfate has now been linked to eye disease, really severe eye disease, and so... Um, uh, you need to come to our website, icnetwork.org, and read the treatment guidelines. Number one, you got to change your diet. Make sure you're drinking plenty of water to dilute your urine. Have the proper testing to make sure that you you don't have a, a, a missed fungal infection or bacterial infection. And the one thing we always want to look at is the quality and health of your skin. Is this because of menopause. If your symptoms began after hysterectomy or after the age of 50, then we know what that's from. That usually means that your bladder is not as well supported because of the loss of estrogen. So we call that the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. And if that's the case, they can give you some uh, vaginal estrogen to use. Then your body will start producing mucus again that will help your bladder protect itself. And then doing something that uses chondroitin. I think you, uh, I would assume that you would have some sort of chondroitin supplement right? So go down to your drugstore and I'm and take a look at supplements. And if you can find one that has chondroitin or glucosamine and chondroitin in it, that would be viable. And then you can also look for one that has quercetin in it, quercetin, but make sure it's not derived from citrus. It needs to be derived from a plant, 
preferably the Sephora plant. If you can get those three ingredients, that's the foundation for most supplements. But pentose and polysulfate is Elmeron. And that has now been linked to a really devastating eye disease. So uh, if you're prone to having eye issues, uh, it would be something that you would probably not want to start, or you would want to at least have an initial eye examination and then an eye examination six months later to make sure your retinas aren't changing. Hi, Fern. Thank you. Yeah, we're okay for now. Taylor says, my symptoms have always gone more in line with pelvic floor or diverticulum. My MRI was normal. Is it worth it to look at a possible skin gland infection? You know, Taylor, I have to say, the very first article I put on the IC network in 1993 was about an infection of the periurethral gland that was produced by doctors at UCLA. Who knew that a woman had a prostate? But we do. We do, it's called the periurethral gland. It's halfway up your urethra. So your urethra is about the size of your little finger, right? So about halfway up the urethra, wrapped around the outside of it is a sponge-like gland called the periurethral gland. And that periurethral gland is notorious. Well, uh, what, let's see, in testing, tested as a homologue to the prostate. In other words, exact same structure. So it is the female prostate. Uh, and like the male prostate, it can easily get blocked. The drainage ducts are very, very tiny. So the prostate is known for coming, kind of becoming inflamed and, and infected where it won't drain out. The same is true for the female periurethral gland. Um, and so it's very easy for you to figure out if you have an infected periurethral gland. Basically, all you do is wash your hand. Put on a pair of gloves, a little bit of KY, stick your finger in your vagina just about an inch, not far, and you're going to rub it across the front side of your vagina because your urethra is in the front, right? You just rub your finger right along there. And if you feel something that feels like a hard pimple, a hard, painful pimple, that is an infected periurethral gland. Uh, and you would normally feel, feel that during intimacy, you know, during intercourse, where something is rubbing up against that gland, that hurts. And generally, if you have that, what they do is they have, just like they have to do a prostate massage on a man, they have to do a prostate massage on a woman. And so they have a finger in your vagina, and then they've got a metal rod in your urethra, or a little, they call it a sound, and they push them together to try to get it to pop open. It's not fun. Uh, but uh, I have one good friend who had it done and her culture, it was massively infected. And it was, it, it was fascinating, it, absolutely fascinating, her biopsy results, because there were a lot of different pathogens in there. It was truly what, it, what we would call a heterogeneous cult, uh, population of bacteria, lots of different types of bacteria. Sally's from the United Kingdom. My doctor now doesn't think it's IC due to the recurring infection. Now thinks it's a recurring infection. You're due for a cystoscopy. So having a next generation urine test would be really cool. Ruth says had a urethral diverticulum removed. Yeah. Ruth, were you the, were you the lady that I talked with like two years ago who had the diverticulum exactly the length of your urethra? I mean, it, like it was huge. Uh, Brenda says, when I'm in a pelvic floor, I can't even think. Brenda, we got to fix that, girl. We got to we gotta fix that. You should uh, uh, call me. Call me this week, and hopefully if I'm here, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. Anybody who wants old magazines from the IC Network, all you need to do is mail me your mailing address, um, except if you're in Canada or England, I'm not going to send them there because uh, it costs too much, but I, I will email you some copies if you're from other countries.
You guys are so good supporting each other. I'm so proud of you. Ruth says, still taking Elmer on two times a day and you're processing it, transitioning off. Awesome. So guys, urethral pain. Some of you are talking about urethral pain. I have a great blog on our website, The Seven Causes of Urethral Pain. Go to icnetwork.org and read it because urethral pain can be chemical irritation. Like literally, if I put on a pair of underwear washed in cheer tide, I will have urethral pain. The urethra can be very chemically sensitive, uh, but it is, is usually either extremely tight muscles, uh, the levator muscles, right? I mean, look, you can see them right here. I'm, you guys, seriously, I'm gonna just love using this. So look, so you can, you can see the muscles right here. These are the levators. If these muscles are tight, yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna hurt your urethra. And you can, whoops, oh my God, they fell. Okay, but you can also see how shallow they are. They're, they're shallow muscles, but they're very powerful muscles. Or estrogen atrophy. The bottom half of the urethra is, is remarkably sensitive to the loss of estrogen. Um, it needs estrogen to produce that nice thick coating of mucus. And when you start losing estrogen, your skin gets drier. And that's not only just for your vulva and your vagina, but also for your urethra and your bladder. Suzanne says, what is my thought on V-Fit? Hello, YouTube. You guys, I am simulcasting live. Uh, when I'm looking up, I'm looking at Facebook. When I'm looking down, I'm looking at YouTube. Hello, Iris and Dawn and Donna. It's so good to see you guys. Donna got my desperate mail about IC Awareness Month last week because uh, I just like, guys, I don't know. IC Awareness Month is going to be hard for me this year. So I'm hoping you're all going to step forward and carry the ball while we're fighting fires. Okay, so anyway, Suzanne says, what are my thoughts on VFET? Hold on, I got I to gotta refresh my memory. What the hell is VFET? VFIT, intimate wellness device. What? Is the first and only intimate wellness solution using red lights, LEDs, gentle heat, and sonic neck technology for menopausal women? I don't know. Hmm. I don't I, I don't I I don't I guess I don't understand the mechanism of action. I mean heat would relax muscles. I understand that. Here, hold on, I gotta put my hair up here. It's like 90 degrees here. Oh wait, oh but I have to do it right. I have to do it right, otherwise I'm gonna freak out. Okay, is that right? All right. Oh gosh. You guys remember when I cut my hair last year? Yeah, this is how fast my hair grows out. It grows out easily an inch a month. It's ridiculous. Okay, okay, I'm cool. So Suzanne, I don't know about VFIT. I, I, I mean, I, I, I'd like to learn a little bit more about it. It looks interesting. Elise says I've had a lot of physical therapy and even injections, but lots of my pain is from the front wall of my vagina where the G spot is located or near. They couldn't figure out exactly why. So you struggle with that. So I wonder if you have adhesions there. Did you suffer a previous injury there? And were there adhesions or something? Interesting. You are truly an anatomical mystery to be solved, my friend. Debbie said, had a cystoscopy biopsy fulguration Friday and you are pain free. Yeah, baby. Woohoo! Thank you, Debbie, for reminding us that if you have Hunter's lesions, they have to be treated with Hunter's lesion therapy. They have to be treated with the correct Hunter's lesion therapy. And the thing is, is when you treat lesions, guess what? The pain usually improves dramatically. So Debbie, congratulations. Keep it up.
Uh, Taylor is talking about oxalates, the fact that some foods that contain oxalates can also be very irritating. That is very, very true. And in fact, the first book ever written for IC patients, which I happen to have right here. Whoops. For those of you old timers out there, we got this little gem, A Taste of the Good Life, a cookbook for an icy diet written by Bev Lauman. And this book came out in the 90s and it, it, it rates every recipe on oxalate content. Um, and so yes, it is very, very true. If you have vulvodynia or IC, some of you might react to having crystalline oxalates in your urine. And so reducing those foods. So the biggest foods that have oxalates are going to be spinach, chocolate. Just Google it and you can do it. We have some information on our website. I really like the Volvar Pain Foundation. They're the ones who really tapped into the oxalate diet. They have a couple of really good cookbooks um, and books explaining the low oxalate diet. Cindy says she has her first pelvic appointment mid-October. Awesome. Lee says, I sleep night nightly with a heating pad between my legs, otherwise no sleep, but you can't sleep through the night because it turns off or gets to. So, so, you know, heat helps muscles relax, right? Heat helps muscles relax. And so the assumption here then is that your muscles are tight, perhaps. And so uh, would a muscle relaxant be helpful? It might be interesting to ask your doctor if you could use a little bit of a muscle relaxant to improve your sleep quality. Um, I use Flexoril. I took it two times last night. I take a quarter of a pill because um, I'm grinding my jaw again at night because of stress. Um, and so um, a little tiny bit of Flexoril at night can be really helpful. Or baclofen, B as in boy, A-C-L-O-F-E-N, baclofen is a non-sedating muscle relaxant. It would be interesting. Um, but it sounds like you're having tight muscle, tight muscles on the, in, is it, is it on the inside of your legs? And you have to be careful with heating baths too, because you can burn yourself too, also. Donna says, my bladder just started hurting. I urinated 15 minutes ago. So Donna, what did you eat? What have you eaten today? Jessica, seeing a urogynecologist tomorrow, what should I ask? So Jessica, you're gonna you're gonna walk into that appointment. And you're not going to say I have IC. You're going to walk in. You're going to walk into that appointment and describe your symptoms. Doctor, I have pain after I urinate. Or doctor, I have this buzzing feeling. Or doctor, whenever I do this, it hurts. Or doctor, when I sit too long, it hurts. Your ability to describe your symptoms is everything here. You cannot drop the ball. You have to be able to describe it. And please do not say it hurts down there. Seriously, women, there is no shame in looking at your body. You've got to be able to say, my pain is on my labia. My pain is by my rectum. My pain is inside my vagina. So generally, number one, is your pain inside of your body or outside of your body? That's number one. Number two, is it, where is it? Is it to the left of center or right of center or centered? Because this, if it's to the left or to the right, you just ruled out your bladder, right? That's probably muscle. But if it's centered, then we're really gonna be focusing more on the bladder. Is it low or high? Is it shallow by your skin or is it deep inside your body? Is it sharp like ground glass or is it dull and achy? Bladder wall pain is like razor blades. It's like ground glass. It's sharp. Pelvic floor pain is achier. It's duller. And my friends, it has a burning quality to it. It burns. Muscles that are working hard produce lactic acid that burns. 
You want them to look at the quality and health of your skin. You want them to study your body, right? So you, you want to say, hey, listen, my skin is dry. Could you please look down there and tell me how my skin looks? I mean, really, and don't just say it's fine. Just how does it look? Is it showing any signs of dryness? Is it showing any signs of estrogen atrophy? That's important. You want them to examine your pelvic floor muscles. You want to have a pelvic exam because remember what they do is they will put their finger up here and just gently touch structures. And if it's tight, you need to know that because you will then be sent to pelvic floor physical therapy. If they put their finger in here and it hurts, that's kind of a hallelujah moment because, okay, you found it. Like there's no mystery. Listen, whoops, my, one of my bones just fell. You know, I, I just think that for too long, men and women with pelvic pain have been ignored. Your doctor has just said, it must be infection, give you antibiotics, send you on the way. And it's a failing of Western medicine. It's a failing that doctors don't like to go outside of their box. Urologists want to stay in the urinary tract. Gynecologists want to stay in the reproductive tract. Gastroenterologists want to stay in the bowel. And they don't look at relationships. And the reality is, is if you have a fibroid tumor pushing on your bladder, it is going to give you frequency urgency. If you have endometriosis on your bladder, it is going to give your bladder pain, right? So we have to explore the entire anatomy here. And if your muscles are always tight, we have to figure out why your muscles are always tight. And that could come right back down to a problem with your bones. One leg longer than the other, stuff like that. Okay, hold on. I just got another evacuation announcement. Oh, welcome to my life. Uh, they're just saying stay indoors. And be prepared should fire conditions change. The air quality is unhealthy as fire operations continue. Great. Uh, yeah, we knew that. Okay. Emily says, you just solved another life mystery. I had pain and arousal simultaneously for the first time and no one could understand why. It's a pudendal nerve. Yep. <laughs> she says, I can't listen to you for five minutes without learning something huge. No, I'm glad I can help. Donna says, what do I think about mast cells? Well, ma mast cells I think are really interesting because we have mast cells throughout our body and mast cells are kind of like an early warning system that there might be something wrong for lack of a better term. So if you had a mosquito bite, and the mosquito injects the venom, it's the mast cells that release histamine in reaction to that. Um, and so we do know that there's a lot of mast cell activities in the bladder wall if the bladder wall is not healthy. If the bladder wall is not healthy and urine is getting into the bladder wall, those mast cells are gonna be releasing a lot of histamine, which is gonna cause a lot of redness, et cetera, et cetera. Oh guys, by the way, by the way, by, by, by the way, hold, Hold on. Hold on. I got to I got to show you something. Okay. Something else from the American Urology Association meeting. And again, you're going to find all of my notes on this. Like half of the magazine is dedicated to all the new stuff. So, These are Hunter's lesions, right? Okay, so these are the big bloody wounds in the bladder that anywhere from five to 10 to 15% of IC patients might have. And these are the patients, like a, a patient in here just had hers cauterized, right? And that's what you do. We give it a lesion specific therapy. You can tell with a lesion, there's a center and then there are kind of arms that, that spread from it, that radiate from it. 
And we now, uh, there is a very consistent effort now to split Hunter's lesions away from everybody else as a separate disease. And in fact, that has now been done in two new sets of guidelines, one in Asia and one in Europe, where if you're diagnosed with Hunter's lesions, you have a completely separate thing from the rest of us. And in fact, I have a whole new website that I'm going to build on that. That's going to be at huntersleasions.org. Um, so Hunter's lesions, a lot of AUA was dedicated to Hunter's lesions. Just fascinating, fascinating research. But what the hell are these? Right? Like seriously, what are the, what are the red spots? What are the red spots that are found in lots and lots of people. Now, the history of IC is really interesting because we've done a full circle. Because in the 1920s, this was thought to be IC, right? When they developed the very first cystoscopy, cystoscope, this is what they saw. And this is what they called interstitial cystitis. And then about 20 years, 30 years later, the device got better so they could see more and they were doing different testing. They were actually, I think, putting more fluid in the bladder. So then they started seeing these, which we call glomerulations or petechial hemorrhages, right? So, then, um, in 1978, uh, doctors uh, Messing and Stamey wrote what they believed to be the pivotal early article about IC, in which they suggested, and I'm pretty sure I'm right in this, they believed that this accounted for the majority of quote-unquote IC. And then... In 1987, the uh, National Institutes of Health Diagnostic Criteria of IC for research studies said, it is a diagnosis of IC if you see this or you see this accompanied by symptoms, accompanied by symptoms, frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. And Dr. Phil Hanno, who taught the big class on IC, said that led us 30 years in the wrong direction. It led us down the wrong pathway because they started believing that this was IC, right? But then something amazing happened. And that is a couple of researchers started doing hydrodistensions on women without symptoms, with completely healthy bladders. They were scheduled to have their tubes tied. And they offered, they, you know, participated in a research study to just see what the consequences of a hydrodistension with cystoscopy were. So what did they see in healthy women without IC symptoms, healthy men? They saw this. So then they were like, uh-oh, maybe this is just a byproduct of the test and it has nothing to do with it. come forward to the American Urology Association guidelines for IC that were released in 2011. The AUA guidelines didn't ask for any of this, specifically this. The AUA guidelines made a diagnosis of IC based upon your symptoms. They abandoned this. And guess what? Guess what? The American Urology Association this uh, meeting this year these are now completely irrelevant, irrelevant. They believe that, that this says nothing about the state of your bladder, that this is in fact what happens to your bladder potentially when your bladder is stretched. Mind blowing. So we are now back to where we were in, 19, in the 1920s. We now believe 
that this Hunter's lesions is technically interstitial cystitis. And for those of us who have a healthy bladder or who have this as a result of the test, that we have, we are bladder pain syndrome or technically the correct word is urologic chronic pelvic pain syndrome. We have pelvic pain. From what? Could be from the bladder, could be from the reproductive tract, could be from tight muscles. There's no doubt we have pain. There's no doubt we have pain. It's not, it's not delegitimizing us at all in any way, shape, or form. You guys, my feed is going really quick. And listen, if you find these meetings helpful, would you please, and I know it's hard this year. I know it's really, really hard this year with COVID. But if you're on Facebook, you can give us, you can throw some stars our way, which would be wonderful. Uh, or you can come on over to our website and buy something or become a member. It would be great. Primary issue, urethral burning. Nine times out of 10 with urethral burning, we're looking at estrogen atrophy, Ruth. Bottom half of the urethra is remarkably dependent on estrogen. And if you are in estrogen atrophy, menopause, bam, that urethra starts to scream. It feels like there's a drop of urine stuck in your urethra that won't come out. Brenda, the number is right on our Facebook page or just go to our website. It's right on the top of the page. Just be patient because I don't know what's going to happen with fires tonight. I don't even know if they'll turn off our, our power tonight. Uh, Donna, what do you do if you cannot take estrogen? Um, then you would probably do something like a V Magic or or um, organic um, olive, uh, no coconut oil. Uh, but just remember that topical estrogen is considered much safer than oral estrogen, and so topical estrogen is usually preferred. And it's worth having a. That's kind of embarrassing having a. Having a vulva in my background there. Sorry about that. Talk to your doctor about the the, the risk versus benefits of to topical estrogen because it's considered remarkably safe now. Lee says, I fell on my tailbone uh, in grade six while figure skating, though don't know. Hun, if that could be a that could play a huge role in this because so look. So here's your back, here's your tailbone. And I, I, I always just demo it like that, which technically is kind of a mistake because it's actually the opposite of that. You're, I mean, cause I'm dealing with reverse images here, but look, your tailbone curls under, right? It curls under. And what happens sometimes is your tailbone, if it's broken, it doesn't curl. It, it extends straight or it extends to the left or to the right. And then that tweaks everything. That tweaks everything because you've got muscles that attach to your tailbone and that can create long-term chronic muscle tension. So having tailbone breaks is common. This is a huge in this IC, in IC patient populations. Jessica says, what about scalaxin? SK, I don't know, what the hell is that? I'm going to swear a little bit. Just live with it. Sorry. It's a swearing kind of time right now. Muscle relaxant. Okay. That must be a brand, a different brand name. I don't ever remember anybody talking about this one in the United States. All right. Hold on a sec. I got to check YouTube. How are you guys doing here on YouTube? Ooh, smoke is coming in the window. Donna, Donna, I'm sorry to hear that you're not feeling as well today. Iris says, will there be a new medicine besides Elmeron? No, we do not have another medicine on uh, based on Elmeron. Uh, I have written an Elmeron transition guide on our website and in our store, which will explain more about what you can do. Uh, what your options are if you are getting off of Elmeron. Um, uh, 
Iris has been on antibiotics for over 12 months. Girl, are you any better? You've been on antibiotics for a year. Are you better? Has anything changed? Uh, Sammy says, can you please speak about urinary retention? It seems to be the cause of your IC. Well, urinary retention can, is either happens because you have tight dysfunctional muscles or number two, you might have a, ner a nerve issue going on that's making it difficult for your bladder to function normally. Linda says, what is your opinion of a hydrodistension with Kenalog injections? If injecting a steroid into a Hunter's lesion is a well-known treatment that can be very effective. The only way they can reach the lesion is by doing a hydrodistension. So, and they inject a steroid like triamcinolone or Kenalog right into the middle of the lesion. That is considered very, very effective. Uh, Linda says, when will the V Magic be back in stock? I think, uh, hold on. I think we were, ha I think the manufa manufacturer might have been having some problems with that. Let me look. No, honey, it's in stock right now. We got four of them. You can get the magic right now from our store. Okay. Just know that we might, we probably won't be able to ship until um, uh, later this week. All right. Here, hold on. Do, 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 do. All right. I'm always afraid I'm going to shut down a window accidentally. Oh, you're right, Linda. I was. You're right. Totally. Um, okay, hold on. And I know that I I told I told Heather to do that, um, but I got it. I got it, girl. I got it. You too, man. Squeaky wheel gets a grease. If ever I forget to do anything for anybody, you just, you got to call me on it because I got, I got lots of, lots of things happening. And so it's really, really important guys. Like if you requested free magazines, please understand that our magazines, I mean, I have tons of magazines uh, well, not tons. I probably have like a hundred more magazines that I'm absolutely willing to give to anybody who wants them. I will send them at my cost. If you would like some magazines, just send me your email. I see network at Mac.com. And if you sent you me your email before and you didn't get it, just send it again. Jessica, how do you get the magazine? By becoming a member of the IC Network. It's a quarterly magazine. We send out four issues a year. Um, we're working, just finishing up the summer issue right now. It's a little late because of COVID. Everything's always a little late. I mean, I'm sorry, it is. But anyway, it is what it is. They're good magazines. I catch up in the spring. Everything gets delayed in the fall with fires and all that other stuff. Emily says, it only reduced my pain a number two, but it relaxed my whole body, which relaxed my pelvic floor and my, okay. Big part of my issues are pelvic floor, like Jill just said, and a large part came from, ha okay, I, I won't repeat that. Yeah, got it, got it.
Kelly says, after my hysterectomy, about six weeks later, I woke up burning and it never went away. I burned 24 seven, been to six doctors, can't figure it out, been on every cream. Girl, 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 girl. Number one, burn, is it nerve pain? If it's nerve pain, electrical, something like that, then we're really looking at a compressed nerve or a nerve that was impacted in some way with the surgery. If it's not electrical, then we're really looking, you're probably doing, doing what happened to me. And that is I had severe levator ani spasms for 10 freaking months. It felt like there was a fist up my vagina trying to grab onto my cervical scar, my adhesion where my surgical, where my cervix was. And it was trying to forcibly pull it out of my body. It was this pulling sensation. Um, and those were involuntary spasms of the levator ani muscle. And so, Kelly, if I were you, I would go to a pelvic floor physical therapist and have them check your pelvic floor. But I don't know, when did you have your hysterectomy? You can't do it within, I, you don't say when you had your hysterectomy. You're going to have to wait like six months before you can do it, really. You have to talk to them about it. Mohani says, had my first pelvic floor session. Oh boy, what an experience. I'm hopeful that it will help me. It, it, it's weird. I mean, listen, it's weird. But when you understand the anatomy, when you, when you learn about the anatomy, it makes total sense, right? Oh, guys, you don't need to be nervous with your pelvic floor. I, I, please, please, please don't be nervous about it at all. It's, it's, you know, how do I want to say this? We are in a society that is profit driven and pharmaceutical companies want you to think that you have to take medicine to get better. And we have lost grounding and foundation in how our bodies work. And when muscles get messed up, muscles need muscle work. You know, I did a surgical internship for a year when I got my pharmacology degree. And uh, we did surgery every Tuesday, all day. And what for a year and what i learned from that is how amazing muscles are because they they adapt beautifully they stretch beautifully i could make a little incision like this big and stretch it to this big just by gently tweezing muscles Gent very gently you know very very gently um and then the muscles would would relax and they would go back to normal shortly, right? I mean, muscles are amazing. And when you think about how muscles work, I mean, think of it. I mean, it's just kind of like the bladder. There's such excitement and mystery in how the body works. So you, your muscle fibers are long, lean fibers. So they're like this, right? And when a muscle needs to contract, the fibers slide like this. And then when the muscle relaxes, the, fly, the fibers slide back out. And if, if your muscles get locked, you have a trigger point. You have a bump. They're no longer flat. You now have a bump. And so pelvic floor physical therapy is just really interesting. It's in, number one, we didn't really know all the muscles down there. You didn't know that you got muscle, that you got muscles that go up. You got muscles that go from front to back, low to high, left to right. And a book you really, everybody should get. I mean, I'm telling you, it is the book that really finally helped me understand is this book. Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain, A Holistic Approach for Relief. This is a master class in the book, but it's so easy to read. And the diagrams in this are exceptional. I mean, just you should see, see all the areas that I've got yellowed as I, as I was learning about it. The pelvic muscle team. 
right? The pelvic foot muscles are not solitary entities, rather they share many interconnections and work as a team to facilitate the life supporting functions of abdominal organ support, urinary and fecal control and sexual activity. As they perform their interrelated assignments within the pelvis, they are vulnerable to many local stressors, such as straining with constipation, compression with bike riding and uncomfortable chairs, the trauma of childbirth, surgical procedures or falls or infection in the pelvic organ. Every time one of the teammates is excessively stretched or compressed, the go others go into a responsive spasm. There are also important interconnections between the pelvic muscles, their attachments and the skeletal structure that make them vulnerable to stressors from the upper body and lower extremities. And further, these muscles share the intricate central nervous system connections that can cause them to become dysfunctional. The role of the pelvic muscles in creating pathology cannot be over empathized. They are the root cause of, or a major contributor to the pain and dysfunction of I see vulvodynia and the like. And look at this. So look, here is a muscle knot. Here is a trigger point. So like here's a normal muscle and here's a muscle with a trigger point. And you can see what that bulge in that muscle is doing. Number one, it's, it is compressing a nerve and it's also damaging a blood vessel. And when you got trigger points in your pelvic floor, that muscle simply cannot be healthy. And our therapeutic priority for somebody with tight muscles is to restore blood flow. And the way we do that is we try to get the muscles to relax. It's about getting the muscles to relax. Instead of this, it's this. Lee says, thank you for your, my pain started after sex, but that tailbone thing happened a few years before. Pain started when you were 16, you're 28 now. I feel like I've tried everything, but I go to a Cairo or to yet another PT. Well, see, see Lee, the tailbone injury probably created the foundation for this. It probably uh, weakened muscles. You could have had some trigger points from those muscles that have led to long-term muscle dysfunction. And then having sex that time was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back and turned everything on. And so I think that number one, it would be really nice to know the health of your tailbone. It would be interesting to get an x-ray or maybe work with a physical medicine specialist or orthopedic surgeon to make sure that you don't have a legacy injury with that tailbone because if the, if the bone is crooked, then we kind of need to know. Uh, but also working with another pelvic floor physical therapist who might have a little bit more experience would be good. Uh, a chiropractic, you know, you got to be careful with chiropractors. They get very aggressive. In fact, one of my dear friends now has a broken back from a chiropractor. And it's a miracle he's not paralyzed because they had him on a drop table. And he didn't know he had a broken back for four months. Okay, so chi chiropractic is... They have to be very gentle and very cautious. And it's that's not the culture of chiropractic. I found it tends to be pretty aggressive. Oh, hey, man, you know what? We need to start the Zoom meeting. Annie says, I took your advice on my euro. She said, I have estrogen atrophy. So I got my estrogen cream from the Women's International Pharmacy, and it helped reduce the burning. Also got baclofen, lidocaine suppositories, and it's helping the tightness in the pelvic floor. Yeah, baby. Woohoo! You don't need to be nervous for pelvic floor physical therapy. You don't. Okay, hold on a sec. Let me start the Zoom meeting. I should have started it 10 minutes ago. See, you guys got me all worked up. I got all excited there. I get excited about this stuff. I like it. All right, Zoom. Start. You know, let me make sure. Did I start the right meeting? Hold on a sec. Yeah, I started the right meeting. All righty then. Oh, God. 
seriously, sometimes I look at my face and I scare myself. Right, right. Okay, so guys, so we're gonna we're gonna uh, transition. Oh, hold on. Oh my God, I'm always afraid I'm gonna turn something off by mistake. Okay, so for this portion of the meeting, we're gonna bring on Zoom, and this is where you get to talk to me, and you get to share your story. And so I'm going to put the Zoom link in Facebook and YouTube, and then I will be on um, admitting you one at a time. All right, so Facebook, you just got your link. YouTube, you just got your link. And you let me know if you need, uh, if that doesn't let you in or you need a password. I, and, and this is a perfect time for a quick bio break. That's what we call it in the gaming world. It's not, I need to pee. It's like, let's take a bio break. So everybody, let's take a bio break for a minute. We'll come back and we'll start the Zoom meeting, okay? I'll be right back. I am in love with Jonathan Groff and his performance of King George in Hamilton. I just saw that and I'm just in love with him right now. I cannot stop singing his song. <laughs> All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, hello, Heidi. Hello, John. John, dude, haven't seen you in ages. All right, guys, so for anybody who wants to come into Zoom, sometimes it's a lot of people, sometimes it's few. Let me post, post the uh, link again. And if you don't want to do Zoom tonight, today, that is... That is fine with me. We will just go back to the regular format. Hey, Barbara. Nice to see you. Wait, okay, wait. Where'd my Zoom? There. Oh, wait. Oh, God. Hello, Sarah. And hey. Since I haven't seen you in ages, Lisa, unmute, unmute you. How are you doing? Well, um, challenges, but okay. <laughs> what's happening? What's happening with your IC right now? How are you feeling? Um, so I, I have some pain. I, I have a pretty big kidney stone right now. Oh no! Could, could make things worse, but I've not 
made the level of progress that I've been hoping for with uh, the pelvic pain. Mm -hmm. So, well, so um, refresh our memories here. Is, is your pelvic pain from your muscles or from your bladder, or do you not know? I think it's both. Okay. I, I think it. I have tight pelvic muscles, which are much looser than they used to be okay. after years of physical therapy. Okay. I do have pain with filling and, and pain with urination both. Okay. Okay. In, and how has it changed in the last, say, three months? Um, as we've got a better handle on my pelvic floor tightness, I have less problems with continual pain. Okay. But I... I've not been able to get past the pain with filling and the pain waking me up multiple times at night. So, so remember, we've got the viscerosomatic reflex. Change a muscle. You are, you are like the. I don't see myself. Okay, hold on a sec. I have to mute whoever that is. I have to mute them. All right, guys, don't mute, don't uh, unmute yourself on you, okay, so that I can finish with other people. Okay, so, so John, you are the perfect example of the two reflexes that Dr. Weiss talks, talks about in his book. So a viscerosomatic <laughs> reflex is, wait, 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 hold on. Somebody keeps unmuting themselves. Um. The viscerosomatic reflex, the question is, can an organ change muscle behavior? And the answer is absolutely. If you're in pain, your muscles are gonna get tight to protect you, right? And you're having some of the worst pain you could possibly have because you have a large kidney stone. And if you were here earlier, did you, I was summarizing a lecture that was done on the biome and how they have linked kidney stones to the loss of one bacteria. Did you miss that or did you hear that? No, I did not hear that. Oh, here, okay, what'd I do with it? There is a specific bacteria that is involved with the, um, the processing of oxalates. Mm. And if that, back, and I think it's oxalobacter, but anyway, uh, I've got it here somewhere. If that, yeah, yeah, yeah the, my kidney stones are oxalic acid. Right. So if that bacteria is missing, there are, you have a 70% likelihood of developing kidney stones. Mm -hmm. So so there's some there's some hope there. And uh, I, I can connect with you later about that too. But anyway, so let's get back to this. So you have kidney stones and they hurt like hell and your muscles are get, getting tight to protect you. Okay, so that's a no-brainer. The next question is, can a muscle change organ behavior, which we call the somatovisceral reflex? And the answer is yes, yes, it can. So how does it do that? So let's say, I mean, let's go back in time with your case. When did your symptoms first begin? My, my bladder symptoms began at age five. That's my earliest memory. Okay. Do you have one leg longer than the other? Uh, by about a quarter inch. It's not a lot, but about a quarter inch. Okay. Okay. So whenever your, your, your situation is interesting because your symptoms began at such a young age, right? So there, there's no doubt about that. The question is why? What could have happened back when you were that young? So a five-year-old is now walking. You've been walking for two years, right? Three years, maybe. But if your hips are not level, because one leg is longer than the other, then your hips are not working together. They are now out of balance. And so could some of that been caused by having one leg lo longer than the other? And the answer is yeah. So, so the other thing that went on at that time is that um, I have perfectly flat feet and oh. about age four or five, my parents got special inserts for my feet, mm -hmm. which did not create the flat footedness and instead caused me to roll my feet outward and curl my toes. So my outer toes curl inward because of that. Oh, 
And did you see, you have this book, right? No, I, no, I don't. By the, <laughs> it's free on Kindle Unlimited. Okay. Dude. I'll, I'll write it down. Like breaking, breaking yeah. through chronic pelvic pain. The chapter on the feet is going to knock your socks off. And it, it, you, you, it's going to explain everything. The diagrams in here. Let me just go to that chapter really quick. So, guys, for context here, and just for everybody else, there's always been a group of patients who have tight muscles. Like, no matter what you do, the muscles are always tight. It's like, what the hell? Why are the muscles so tight? And Dr. Weiss, who is the pelvic pain specialist on the West Coast, he was really fascinated by that question. And he could massage the trigger points out calm the nerves down, get everything to relax. But why was that patient back a month later with trigger points in exactly the same spot? And that caused him to look beyond the muscles at the bony structures. And for those of you who have attended my meetings, I've been saying that for two years. Well, he's been, and I never saw him, which is funny, but that's exactly what he did too. But he took it to the nth degree. And so what he found in here, as he, he, de he developed his entire career, on this um, uh, is that ultimately in the end, 90% of the patients with long-term chronic pelvic floor uh, tension had a problem with how they were walking. And um, as an, I, I, I think that, let's see, I'm trying to look for the, like the perfect picture here. So let's just look at this picture here for a moment. So we have ankles rolling to the outside, right? Now, are your ankles rolling to the outside or to the inside? Uh, to the outside. Okay. So Okay, so in your mind you just have to reverse this picture, okay? So look. This is an example of what happens when it rolls on the inside. And if you, so here's a healthy leg. So look, we have a straight line, straight up, and we've got normal tension, especially in the piriformis muscle. But look at where the ankle is rolling inwards. The, the bone actually flexes out and it ends up stretching the piriformis. I see, I, you, you'll see it when you see the book. The, okay, the side with, the side with the foot dysfunction, the muscles are being, they're taut and they're being distorted by the foot distortion. Yeah. And you are just like the, yeah, you have got to get this book. Um, and he has some really good case reports in here. Let me see. I wanted to see if one of these was very similar to you. Did you ever have hip pain or knee pain? Anything like that? A lot of hip pain? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we go. A 50-year-old man has been seeing Okay. A 50-year-old man has been seeing me occasionally over a 10-year period for intermittent perineal pain. I had been treating his tight pelvic floor muscles and trigger points with internal manual therapy, and though he received great relief from these treatments, pain flares continued to occur. Frankly, I'd never completely understood the mechanics of his symptom flares until he came in, came in one day complaining of hip pain while walking over hiking trails. This led me to question him further and ultimately put us on the right track. I asked if there were any other musculoskeletal problems that he had not thought to mention previously. He responded that he always had pain at the base of his large toes that he attributed to arthritis, but because he knew other family members had the same problem, he never sought attention for this quote unquote congenital issue. I then examined his feet, something I was not accustomed to doing, and found moderate overpronation and bunions. At that moment, the light went on. I had found the origin for his hip pain that he had experienced during hiking, but also for his perineal pain. P uh, podiatric treatment eliminated his painful flares. Bunions are a sign of abnormal pronation, which lessens the shock absorbing action of the feet, placing added stress on the leg and hip. This additional stress affects the hip rotator muscles, which are the obturators in the piriformis. The dysfunction of these muscles can create wide range pelvic floor complaints, including perineal pain. 
So it's not exactly your case, but you're just going to read this chapter on the feet and go, we never, it never made sense. And it's, I, I think it's going to make a lot of sense for you. And does he have success treating people? I mean, getting their symptoms to abate? Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, nine, so um, what he reports in his clinic, and now he's 81 now, he's been treating patients for 40 years, is that once he got the feet stable, the muscles relaxed. They didn't, they weren't having the flares that they were, that they were having consistently. They were not having them as frequently. If not, they went away. And remember the consequence of tight muscles is really profound because not only is that limiting blood flow to the bladder, it's very hard for the bladder to be healthy if it doesn't have good blood supply. It's also damaging nerves and it's the ner it's the damaged nerves, which ultimately cause the bladder wall to break down. And that's why you would be having bladder wall sensitivity is because those nerves are just being, being triggered. Uh, uh, irritated nerves release substance P. Substance P causes tissue damage. Substance P would compromise the integrity of the bladder wall. So, so generally for, these pa for the patients whose symptoms start after a muscle injury, they can be on bladder therapies for years and they'll never get better. And they might feel a little bit better, but they'll never get to the point where their symptoms go away because it doesn't, it doesn't deal with the fundamental problem. And the fundamental problem is poor blood flow. So a therapeutic priority is to restore blood flow, number one. And for you, it's, gonna, it's challenging because your feet are, feet are messed up, right? But what is a, what, have you been to a podiatrist recently? Uh, not recently, no. Um, I had uh, inserts, hard inserts or orthotics made many years ago, which uh -huh. were difficult to use. So I get it. I have them too. I, and I, I don't, I don't like the orthotics. Uh, I only wear them in my Uggs. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what I wear are Hoka's. Hoka. Do you mm -hmm. know what a Hoka shoe is? Yes. Um, I, I, you know, every podiatrist I've talked to recommends Hoka's for mm -hmm. anybody with any weird foot issues. And you might find a Hoka might be good, but okay. remember technology changes. We're learning a lot about stuff now. And also technology with respect to devices and inserts and things like that. I would really mm -hmm. encourage you to get the book, read the chapter on the feet so that you really understand the connection. Go back to the okay. podiatrist, say, all right, we now think that the reason why I'm having constant chronic hip and pelvic issues might just come back to how I'm walking. So what can we do to improve how I'm walking? And what about, so I also have pain with sitting, but it's relieved by standing. Is that all part of this? Yeah, yeah. that's just tight muscles that are basically compressing nerves. Okay. You know, so I, I mean, listen, I'm not a doctor. I, obviously, obviously I should, I cannot, and I should not be giving you medical advice. My job here is to open your eyes to different possibilities. Mm -hmm. And your case is so compelling and follows Dr. Weiss's model like perfectly, okay. like perfectly. Okay. And so at least get the book, check the book, read it out. And I would just really love to hear what they have to say about how you're walking. You know that when, um, I, think, I think I'm older, I'm, I definitely look older than you, but my brother uh, is uh, seven years older than me, so he's 67. I'm sick. I just turned 60. Um, they gave him, because he was pigeon toed, these really heavy shoes with a metal bar between them. And, you know, they didn't know any better. You look at how he walks now and it's not very good. So, yeah, yeah. I, I wore something called scaphoid pads. Mm -hmm. They were, which were to try to fix my flat feet. And it didn't work. Like I said, it just rolled my feet outward and curled my two outer toes inward on both sides of my feet. Wow. How long did you wear those? Um, maybe a year. Okay. I don't remember exactly because it was around age four or five okay. when they tried to correct that. Okay. Well, let's so. see. You know, again, 
I, I think a podiatrist would be really interesting. Okay. okay. Well, listen, okay. really nice to see you. Great. You. I, you, what a perfect way to start our Zoom chat was, was with you. You know, and think about all those years you've been told it's your bladder, 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 bladder. And yet there are other things involved. And that's the mm -hmm. exciting thing about life today and a diagnosis of IC is we have so much hope. Mm -hmm. We get it now. We understand we, our, our horizons are so much broader than they used to be. And as Dr. Weiss says, and as Dr. Chris Payne said in his subtyping, it is a tragic that patients are told that this is incurable. When for many of you, especially people with muscle issues, it is curable. Yeah. yeah. My current neurologist tells me that it's incurable. So. Well, you know, it is what it is. Um, but when you, when you actually look at kind of that upper echelon of doctors, especially yeah. Chris Payne in his, cre in, in his subtyping system, that's a direct quote. It's, a, it's, it's exactly the way he feels. And I will just say that in our experience, when we are uh, working with patients who clearly have muscle issues, the reports are very positive. Okay? Okay. All right. Nice talking with you. You too. And I, I still need to take a lesson from you on Zoom <laughs> at some oh, point in time. Sure. <laughs> I, I was hoping I had big plans for doing a whole bunch of lectures uh, during IC Awareness Month, but with the fires, it's just, mm -hmm. I, I just, I, we're going to have to put it off, I think, a, a couple of months um, until things are a little bit more stable here. So, all right. Okay, Heidi. I have to unmute Heidi. Hello, Heidi. I'm, okay, are you, wait, 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 hold on. Heidi, can you unmute yourself? We did it. Okay. How you doing, girl? How is I'm life? okay. I told my husband, I said, don't leave. She's going to call me next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how are, I see that you're laying in bed. Are you... Oh, because I want to. Okay. How are you feeling? Better? Right now, I'm feeling fantastic. Yeah, baby. Hey, man, compared to how you were two weeks ago, that's an improvement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do you what do you believe is the uh, cause for you feeling better? <laughs> um, Gary, should I tell her? <laughs> I'm on a really strong pain med. Oh, oh, that's okay. Well, wait, you had this, didn't you have the surgery? And we couldn't talk. Yes, I'm allowed, to, I'm allowed to talk about that now. Um, I had um, the new Medtronic um, Interstim that was newly FDA approved. I got that put in um, August 3rd or 4th-ish. Okay. As the first patient, one of the first patients in the U.S. to get it. And so this and is a new Interstim that has a rechargeable uh, generator. And so rather than, so you just hold a little device up to it and it will recharge it? Correct. Nice. And how was the, sur right. how was the surgery? Surgery was great. Awesome. Oh my God. You were so, you were so freaked out and you were really scared. I mean, when you were in the room, you, you seemed to be, you were really scared about it. And so it went really well. And the surgery went well, and Dr. Peters was the champion, right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> See, guys, look, for people watching, you know, there's a huge difference between working with a local doctor who doesn't have, you know, a, a strong interest in IC versus somebody of national reputation who loves the work, is dedicated to work, and is an innovator like Dr. Peters or Dr. Moldwin or Dr. Evans. So, so do you feel like the device, how are your frequency levels? Are they better? Oh my gosh, 10, 10 times better. I can go like, I can make it through the night without having to urinate. Girl, this is awesome. Now, did he also implant a, a new lead? Did he implant a lead too? Okay. Yes. Okay. And how is your, uh, uh, your urgency? Is your, are you having any urgency where you're suddenly having to go to the restroom really quick? Okay, excellent. Nope. Now, so what? So, 
Um, but you're but you're still taking pain medicine. Is that because of you're still in the post op recovery? No. Okay. Um, this, um, the interesting does not help with pain. Right. And I have severe pain issue. Oh my goodness! To the point where I stay home, connected to my bathroom. That's how often I. That's how much, it, how often I was going, but now how much pain it hurts with my bladder wall. It just, mm, it's ridiculous. Okay, so so what does your doctor say about the pain? What do we know? Um, do, do we know? Doctor Peter was was hoping that this would help with the pain, but he didn't guarantee it because that's not what it's for. But it might. Okay. And it didn't. Well, um, it's my primary care doctor that put me on the pain medication. Okay. So do you have Hunter's ulcers or lesions or? I did. Okay. Okay. Did, did Dr. Peters do a hydrodistension and look at your bladder when he was doing the inner stem too, or did he just do the inner stem? He attempted to, but because of the anesthesia or I was not, I, I was actually just twilighted. Okay. So he couldn't do it. Uh, okay. The surgery was lasting longer than normal, and so he flipped me over, attempted the hydro, but actually just let my urine be the expander, Okay. and then just emptied it. Okay. That's all I did. Okay. So um, he wasn't able to successfully do an actual hydrodistension. I'm scheduled to do that uh, September 9th, I believe, Good. but I get those hydrodistensions done like every six weeks. Okay. Six weeks? Yeah, wow. baby. Wow. Um, yeah. And, and he doesn't like it. <laughs> are they cauterizing every time? What are they doing? Every uh, time? No, he, um, he himself that has not seen my Hunter's, Hunter's lesion. Um, I had it first diagnosed um, 15 years ago with my local urologist. Okay. And that urologist um, cauterized it. Okay. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what he sees when, you know, because, you know, again, having an expert actually look at it is critically important. And we want to try to understand why the hell your bladder wall is screaming the way it is. Um, right. I mean, that's just so incredibly important. And, and I think it, given some of the new research uh, that has shown potential viral infection connected to Hunter's lesions, uh, I, it'd be really interesting, you know, to maybe do some sort of next generation test. You know, he uses. I did. Okay, and and what did that find? Um, two organisms of which he could not pronounce. Okay. Remember that I was explaining that one to you. Yeah. Um, he put me on doxycycline, and then my bladder screamed. Okay. He was very pissed off. Right. Me. Um, it was um, on fire. Okay. Down there, I mean, everywhere. And so he put me on a steroid okay. to calm it down. And I, I, I just, I'm just on a pain med because it just is continue, continue. Okay. Well, you've got, you've got another step to your journey. The good news yep. is the one you just had, you've gotten through, it went well. And mm -hmm. congratulations, and you have got some national press too. I saw that as the first patient to have this, or one of the first patients. You to saw this. that? I did. I Yay! Did. Yeah, I did. So congratulations on that. And now we still have to figure out the mystery, and I think you're in good hands. Absolutely. So you're going to come back in October, and you're going to you're going to tell us what's going on. Hey, wait, back. Uh, my dad is playing the wastebasket like a drum. Thank you. <laughs> um, I would say come in, come in and introduce yourself, but you are still wearing your pajamas. And I'm not sure if you want people to see you. Dad, it's 2.30. Time to put some clothes on. <laughs> He's 97. That's okay. Yeah. All right, Heidi. Well, listen, keep us posted. I'm glad you're feeling better, and I'm glad you've got some meds that are helping you. All right. Thank you. Okay, hon. See you later. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, let's go to Jessica. Jessica, are you here? Yep. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't see you. Can you turn your video on? If you don't want to, yep. that's fine. 
Let's give it a shot here. Okay, she just muted herself accidentally. Okay. Okay, so you're so you're now on audio. Do you want to turn your vi video on? I tried, but I'm oh, not oh, wait having... a second. I okay. So wait, wait. Oh. I don't know. I'm not good with these either, but I've never had an issue with the video not just popping up. Um, I just sent you, I think something as can you just click on that? It says you will start your video later. Can you send it one more time? Sorry, my phone's kind of old. Yeah, okay. I can definitely see. It yeah, works. you can see me. I'm Rudy. I haven't had my hair done in forever. Oh, it's um, it looks beautiful. All right, well, thank you. How are you doing? How is your eye? Awful. <laughs> Not good. Uh-oh. I've been... Um, uh -oh. Sorry. That's okay, hon. If there's anybody you can cry to, it's me. I'm giving you... Um, I'm, I'm going to work a for a year to get better. Okay. Um, I'm in PT. I had to stop because I got COVID. Oh. And then I had to stop because the world got COVID and I started again. So I've had seven or eight sessions, but I feel like I'm just... I'm getting worse. And I'm seeing a urogynecologist tomorrow. And then I'm seeing... Another one by the name of um, Dr. B, everybody calls him, in Louisiana. He does embedded UTIs. But basically, I'm, see I'm seeing Dr. Kylie tomorrow, and she's in West Palm. And I don't really know what to even ask. I'm so miserable. It's my pelvic floor. It's my, my chiropractor did an x-ray for me of both my um, nerve and my tailbone for me. So they're going to look at that. Okay. But my pudital nerve hurts really bad. Um, I have urgency. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm so, pretty miserable. I know. And I I'm tell. on pain meds. I'm not on high pain meds. So it basically keeps me like sane, but I can't do anything. Okay. So let's, we have to break. Now, listen, whenever you feel overwhelmed and overloaded, it's important to break it into manageable little pieces right okay and here hold on a sec i gotta turn on it's okay okay so so let's let's break this apart let's let's just kind of break your situation apart so so number one we know you're having pelvic floor issues because you were at yeah. physical therapy tell us what did the physical therapist find um well we did um, she noticed I have, I have a lot of pelvic pain on my perineum. Um, she always, I always have like one side or the other being an issue. And sometimes it just flip flops. It does. It's me not too. specific. Yeah, me too. Mine it flip -flops. doesn't take one side. Um, okay. I've definitely noticed cause I'm double jointed. I can move my leg more, um, when my spine is, um, more of a hump when you do the yoga versus like making it smush together if that makes sense like kind of like arching your back like a cat or okay. when you do a pose for sunshine and the more like for yoga you, okay. just, you put your you can correct your back right. so I lost um, movement when I do that and she also had me doing osteoporosis exercises which helped my pedal on the nerve for about a week and then I went right back to to feeling horrible again but it didn't help my pelvic floor pain it just helped my pedal nerve well okay so structurally we we have to focus on the health of your muscles first right okay. because it's the muscles that are affecting everything else it's the muscle that's squeezing the nerve when did this all begin for you when did well i actually start? started with having like the, I hate I hate to say, it, but I see because I don't know any better. But I see sometimes I couldn't eat like Indian food or I love food from all over. I started not being able to eat anything. Okay, but when but when was that? When that was about five or six years ago, okay. and then two or three years into it, I got pelvic floor disorder, and it's just gotten so bad now I can't even sit in a chair. It's embarrassing. Okay, so how old are you now? I just turned 37. 
the thirties are great. Well, they're not great for you right now. No. In, in hindsight, listen, I'll when, go back to my twenties. When you're please. in your sixties, when you're in your sixties, you're gonna back and look at your thirties and go, "Yeah, baby, I was young then." Okay, so, um, so you were in your early thirties when this all began. This entire spectrum of bladder stuff yeah. began when you're 31, 32, somewhere in there. What? Can you do you associate any event with the onset of your symptoms? A trip. I know there isn't like anything specific. I mean, my life has been stressful, but I mean, I'm well, just a but, stress ball, okay, and my but, therapist but, says I'm an internalizer, so okay. I don't know if that helps. I know, but that's listen, I, I, I don't care about you, shouldn't care about that. That's that's a type of that's telling people that it's their fault. And this is not your fault. You have done nothing wrong. There is no shame. There is no blame. There is something structurally dysfunctional about your pelvis. This is not. Yeah. And yes, you might not be holding your stress as well. You might be subconsciously tightening muscles. But I don't want you to. Yeah. I don't want you to start thinking that this is your fault in any way, shape or form. Something at some point in time happened. And either it was a bladder injury or a pelvic floor injury or something else that happened. Right. So again, yeah. let's go back in time for a moment. You were 31, 32 years old. What was happening then? Were you in a job that you liked? Were you in a new relationship? Had you had a baby? Um, had you gone through chemo? No, I don't have any. I mean, I was, I'm trying to remember. I, they moved me around so much because I worked in the school system, but. Are you a teacher? I ended up working really school psychologist, but oh, I um, okay. I ended up just ha having the life sucked me out like dry. They put me in like the roughest schools and okay, so you're so I you're just, okay, got it. And you know, isn't it? So interesting? I, I will never go back to the school system if I ever work again. It'll be private practice. <laughs> well, you know, and the thing is, is that there is a significant number of patients whose symptoms began when they were in a job that that really treated them bad. Because stress takes a toll. And one of the things that happens yeah. when you're under stress is that you start tightening muscles. And if you're in the school system, you also know that you're, although you you might not have the same, might not have had the same challenges that teachers had, restroom access is sometimes an issue too. Oh, I rarely ever got to use the restroom. Right. And so, and, ridiculous. and so that, and the books talk about this, the books and and I just read reading another journal article that talked specifically about how the bladder can get injured when you hold for long periods of time, that that's okay. not normal. That creates a cycle of, well, it creates a, it just creates, it begins a cycle of lots of other things happening. So mm -hmm. um, what about, were you an athlete? Did you run? <laughs> no. Okay. I mean, I used to run for fun on the treadmill, but no one would ever call me an athlete. Okay, but were you, but, <laughs> I were you, tell you that one. but were you running on the treadmill at that time when you were 31, 32? Um, off and on, but once I started getting IC flares, they would get so bad it was like okay. I'm not running anywhere but to the bathroom. Okay, okay, but we're still talking before your IC began. How was your okay. diet? Were you were you a diet um, soda drinker or were you pretty good? I was not a good water drinker. I was one of the Atkins people who drank diet soda. Oh, okay. 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 So, so we have what I call the chicken versus the egg dilemma, which comes first the chicken or the egg. And for us, it's which comes first the bladder or the pelvic floor. Yeah. They're both involved. You know that they're both involved for John. They were both involved. They cannot not both be involved. They're too interconnected, but one is normally driving the other. And okay. so it doesn't sound like you sustained any major injuries at that time. You weren't in any car accidents. You weren't raped. There wasn't anything. Um, I did have a car accident in undergrad, but okay. I have a herniated disc um, and they told me I'd never run again, but okay. uh, I ran stupidly. <laughs> So, and what disc? What disc? What disc is it? Uh, something seven. I don't know. It was okay. so long ago. I know, but I think it was. But it it it, it, it it's it's relevant. It's extremely yeah. relevant to this situation. So there's there's one of two scenarios here. Scenario number one is mm -hmm. that 
you sustained a series of minor, minor muscle injuries, starting with the I'm listening. I'm just writing down notes. <laughs> yeah. So you, you sustained a series of injuries and you didn't mm -hmm. know you were hurt. You really didn't, you had no clue that there was a, something going on. But as I showed in the picture, the more trigger points you have, the more blood flow gets messed up and the more nerves get messed up, right? And so finally, there's a straw that breaks the camel's back that turns the pain on. And that could have been okay. something as simple as a long car ride or a period of very, very high stress or whatever, but your pain mm -hmm. got turned on. So, 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 so scenario number one is that it was a muscle, muscle issue. Your muscles just got tighter and tighter and tighter. And, and as the, as the uh, blood flow is compromised to the bladder and as the nerves get dysfunction, your bladder starts breaking down. You have no clue you have a muscle injury. All of a sudden, one day it's frequency urgency. And you go to the doctor. And the doctor goes, this must be an infection. They give you antibiotics. They don't work. You go back mm -hmm. to the doctor. The doctor goes, it must be overactive bladder. They give you overactive bladder mitts. They don't work. They might help a yep. little <laughs> tiny bit, but they don't work. You go back to the doctor. The doctor says, hey, you've got ice tea. They give you Elmeron, and that doesn't work. And the reality for the muscle patient is no bladder therapy is going to fix them. Okay. And that's the tragedy here is we've had patients who have been on Elmeron for 20 years. And what we know after the fact that it really was never really their bladder that was the driving force. It was muscles. And our therapeutic mm -hmm. priority for the muscle injury patient is to restore blood flow. Right. So here's yeah. the thing is you went to the pelvic floor physical therapist. Yeah, I'm still going. Mm -hmm. Your muscles were clearly tight. Yeah. Pelvic floor therapy helped, right? Um, it helps my pedal nerve, but it I haven't yet gotten relief for my um, perineum. It's so bad. I feel like I'm sitting on a baseball all the time. Okay. Or so, like I'm birthing a baby. <laughs> so let's do a little anatomy lesson here for a moment. Because when, when I was flaring the worst, it was always my perineum. Always. Yeah. I mean, it felt like somebody was rubbing sandpaper over it. It just like raw, okay. like a raw, deep burning. And again, the book of books. Oh yeah. I'm going to get that for sure. I wrote talks, that down. <laughs> talks about it. And I want to, I want to show you something. Let's see. I want to get the best picture here. Okay. Uh, I see it's, hot. it's so hard for me to show these pictures. I can see it. I have good okay. vision, small, but bad okay. far away. <laughs> so, so here we have, hold on, the vaginal opening and yep. the bowel. And right in between is a little round body that's called. That I hate. <laughs> it's called the perineal body. Yep. Now, do you know what the per do you know what the perineal body is? Evil. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just in so much pain. I have to laugh through it otherwise. No, girl, it. it's okay. The perineal body, located at the midpoint of the double triangle, which I can explain, is a fibrous attachment point for many of the surrounding perineal muscles. It's an attachment okay. point. And so if we get, so like here is, here is the, the, the little in-person exam. And I need to like draw a little round circle on it. Um, if you look at the way the muscles flow here and here, they are attaching right here. Mm -hmm. And then we also, the muscles also, and we also have these levators and these levators that attach right here at the perineal body. That's why okay. the perineum is hurting is because okay. there is extreme tension or pressure on this perineal body structure. And so 
again, that points in many cases to muscle issues. So ha, um, not to ask you an embarrassing question, because obviously people are watching no. this on YouTube. I mean, they can't see your face. They're just hearing you and on Facebook. Um, I, I always hate asking super embarrassing questions. Did you always dread going to the OBGYN because you knew the examination would be painful? Um, not really. Okay. Honestly, I mean, when I was in high school, I dislocated my knee just in my bedroom and I popped it in and the next day I went to school. Like my parents were tough. So no. <laughs> okay. Was, was sex comfortable or painful? It's always been painful. Okay. But I started late in life, so uh, okay. But but see, there you go. So yeah. so you have vaginismus, right? That vaginismus is basically long term chronic tight pelvic floor muscles. And so for you saying, sex has always been painful. That points right to vaginismus. You've already had a physical therapist confirm that your muscles are tight, so that makes total sense. And so, um, and. Pudent, the reason why the pudendal nerve is involved is because if we if we look at this, let's just look at the back of it. So right, here's your sacrum, right? And there are four holes in the sacrum that the nerves come through. Okay. So the nerves come through the holes right here. They go independently through the pudendal nerve, I mean, I'm sorry, through the piriformis muscle, then they merge mm -hmm. together and they go through something called the Alcox canal where it's influenced by a different muscle and then they split apart down here to innervate your vulva and all that other stuff. So clearly your perineal nerve is being entrapped by something usually a tight muscle. And okay. so therapeutically, what they would be doing is number one, focusing on trying to figure out where the nerve is compromised and then trying to release it. Okay. And so, um, um, and one of the things that they also might do is uh, a nerve block, you know, especially, you know, especially if it's super, super active right now and you cannot sit at all then something like a pudendal nerve block, which would just cut things off to give your body time to calm down, certainly makes sense, right? It mm -hmm. certainly makes sense in this context. Um, and they could even do uh, Botox therapy in the muscles to try to get the muscle to release rather than in the bladder wall, but in the muscle itself. Your, this, okay. your OBGYN, I'm glad you're going to the urogynecologist tomorrow because you're, you're, you could your urogynecologist could also maybe give you some compounded creams like a, uh, there's a, there are a whole bunch of different compounded creams that are available. One is called an Amibac cream. It's A-M-I-B-A-C. And it's a combination mm -hmm. of amitriptyline, baclofen, which is a muscle relax. So amitriptyline calms nerves down, baclofen relaxes mm -hmm. muscles. They can even put ketamine in there to reduce pain or lidocaine in there to reduce pain. We wanna to try to focus on calming that nerve down any possible way that we can. And so using a, a very simple, and Dr. Weiss talks about that in the book, how important it is to assess nerve dysfunction and treat the nerve. And he starts at the skin with a lidocaine cream. You know, on okay. your perineum, would a lidocaine cream make it better? That's we just need to. It's just like all the nerves are just on fire, so we just have to get the nerves to 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 quit for a while. And using something like lidocaine is perfectly reasonable. I would be stunned if your doctor wasn't willing to give you some sort of topical compounded cream to help you with this. Right now, I'm taking Valium, like five milligrams, but it's not. Well, it's not, gonna, but, but that's just a muscle relaxant. That's not going to calm the nerve down. What's going to, okay. what's going to calm the, calm the nerve down would be maybe something like gabapentin 
or using that. I tried that. It made me really sick. Okay. Well, ask her about other things that do something like that. Did the gabapentin okay. make you sick because the dose was really high? Mm -mm. It was really low, but like I couldn't hold things. I was dropping things. My brain felt it was like it was floating. Okay. Just not good. But see, this is where ketamine might be particularly useful. Using a, a, a ketamine cream down there could, could actually uh -huh. help calm that nerve down a little bit more. I didn't know they had a cream. I've heard of it, the the shots or whatnot at my pain doctor's office, but yeah, I'll yeah. ask about the cream. Yeah. Um, the and I know it, I don't know if it's helpful, but I remember a long time ago, one of my sister's friends shoving me to the floor and me hitting my tailbone. I don't know. Well, if... that, would, that would just be another injury. That would be another source of trauma or injury. And so okay. and that's what they consistently see is a series of minor injuries over time that finally build into by the time you're in your thirties, you know, and wear and tear is taking a toll on your body. That's when it generally starts to turn on is in your late twenties or early thirties. The other thing is kind of what I talked to John about. And that is that mm -hmm. if your muscles are chronically tight, we want to ask, is there anything else going on with your pelvis or with your bony structures, which is keeping them tight? Like, yeah. are, are, do you walk normally? Do you, have mm -hmm. a, do you have a bad hip? Do you have bad knees? Do you have one leg longer than the other? Um, and so, I don't, if, well, I don't think so, but well, I'll have a, I'll my, my chiropractor double check for sure. Well, are your physical therapist, they should watch how you walk down a hallway. You know, like for me, so like for me, okay. um, because I have had long-term, my pudendal nerve, I have a slight pudendal nerve entrapment on my left side. And it will vibrate. It so hurts. I feel it, so bad for you because yeah. it's awful. <laughs> well, and, and for me, it's it vibrates first. Like it's vibrating right now if I've been sitting here for two hours now. So two and a half hours. So it's at, definitely at the vibration stage. It will eventually get to the pain stage if I, I leave it too long. Um, but anyway, what was I going to say? What was the point I was going to make here? Oh, we're okay. talking about physical therapy and right. walking. So. So what was happening is that the pain really over the last 15 years just was just mm -hmm. getting worse and worse and worse, always on my left side. And, okay. and then we learned about pudendal nerve entrapment and yes. And then I had the vibration and the, and my gynecologist was like, yes, you definitely have a slight pudendal nerve entrapment on a little tiny, a little tiny fiber of it that kind of goes backwards, uh, goes back towards the butt cheek. That's where it was. But mm -hmm. the, really, the real big question was, why was it entrapped in the first place? And so yeah. I, I go to Kaiser, I go to physical therapy. They get, they, I do everything. I mean, they fired me from their classes because they say I'm way too good. I can do everything that patients have a hard time <laughs> doing it. Because, you know, I at one point in time was a pretty good athlete. Um, and um, That's awesome. No, but it was getting worse. Like, yeah. you, like two years ago, I had a hard time sitting. I'm just like you after, after these meetings, yeah. I'd be crying. So I finally went to a sports physical therapist because I gave mm -hmm. up on Kaiser. I mean, the physical therapist, they just had me stretching. It's like, okay, yeah, that's they, not good. they were like just saying, Jill, it's just, it's just a tight muscle. You, you just have a tight damaged piriformis muscle. You just need to stretch. Let me tell you, I can stretch like, a, you know, I'm good. I can touch my nose to the ground when I'm stretching my piriformis. Yeah. Okay. So I go to the, pel I go to the sports physical therapist and he has me walk down the hallway and he goes, do you realize when you walk, you walk outwards, you walk in the arc, you, you walk like this, you're going bang, bang, bang on one side. And I'm like going, no, mm -hmm. let me do it again. I walk down again. He goes, you, don't you see that you're actually, you don't walk in a straight line. You have this little arc when you walk. And he goes, hmm. I know what you've got. So we'd go into the room and we start looking at my SI joint. And he goes, yeah, your, your SI joint is definitely a big part of this. But then mm -hmm. I, start, I started showing him what Kaiser had me doing on my stretches. And I demonstrated touching my nose to the ground, stretching on my piriformis. And he screamed at me, stop. 
He goes, stop. Oh my God, stop. Don't do that. And I'm like, mm-hmm. why? He goes, because you have stretched out your muscles so badly, your left glute doesn't even turn on anymore. Your right glute is doing all the work because you have massively overstretched uh, the other side. Uh, and he said, yoga is the wrong thing to do. It's Pilates. Mm-hmm. Okay. So anyway, the point that I'm trying to make here is it was a sports physical therapist who helped okay. me figure out the whys and hows of why my left side is compromised. My pet, my, my SI joint is the problem. My pelvic floor muscles are tight to protect my SI joint. And ultimately mm-hmm. it's a problem with the ligament and okay. everything they were telling me to do was the wrong thing to do. I overstretched, overstretched, mm. overstretched, weakened the muscle until the muscle just stopped working. And so it, the muscle works. Sorry. No, no, no. But the good news is he changed my workout. The muscle turns on now. I know. Exactly. Okay. So everything's Thank better. God. massively better. So I think you're dealing probably with something similar, some sort of similar mechanical abnormality. That's possible. Yeah, because in, in college, when I hurt my back, it was my mid-back. But when I went to grad school and working, I remember my therapist, I just went and got massage. He joked, he's like, you're a tight ass because my low back was so tight and my glutes are so tight and my chiropractor can't crack my lower back he's like it's so tight I can't even crack it and don't even crack and just like seriously don't have your lower back cracked like I've got a very good friend who just had his back broken at L5 the worst area from a chiropractor this is really more instead about trying to understand why your muscles are so freaking tight and it's either a series of recurring injuries or you've got a bony structure abnormality and that's why you want them to Watch you walking down the hall. Watch how you're walking. Watch how your feet are being placed. And let's make sure that something else isn't isn't at the root of this. So, All right. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I mean, you're you're just you're you're just checking all the boxes. Long term yeah. chronic glute tension. So so you know, I think you're a perfect example again of the somatovisceral reflex. How muscles can affect organs but scenario number two could also be that you were drinking so much diet soda that you just irritated the hell out of your bladder and but that would have healed by now i would have expected that would have healed but the legacy of that would still be tight muscles that could have been yet another trauma so you're you're heading in the right you're heading in the right direction you you you're and so i'm so when you go to your urogynecologist tomorrow you're talking about tight muscles how to sc- and mm-hmm. how to quiet uh, nerves, and let's see what they have to say. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you so much. Well, carry hope in your heart. Carry hope in your heart, my friend. And you're gonna check. All right. in. You'll check in maybe next week if we're here, and let us know how it goes. Right. Yep. Awesome. All right. <laughs> I'll say a prayer for you. I think things are gonna turn around. I got All right, better. Thank you so much. Look, I'm sitting yep. here. No pain. <laughs> just a little flutter. Yay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Taylor. Taylor, Taylor, Taylor. Hey. Hey, girl. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. You gonna put your, are you going to put your a- camera on? I don't know how to. I've never done this before. Okay. Do you know where it is? Uh, are you on a computer or are you on hey, a... Hey, yeah, there you go. Hey. hey. Sorry, I just took a shower. So I'm like, no, makeup on or whatever. But That's whatever. okay. That's okay. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. Um, my pain is not as severe as some others. Um, okay. But um, I do know for a fact I've had two different types of urea plasmas. And I definitely have pelvic floor dysfunction. Okay. And I definitely have scoliosis. That's what I know for a fact. Okay. Um, um, but my, ha, ha, go ahead. How old are you? I'm actually 28. Okay. And when did your symptoms start? Um, they started probably when I was about 22. Okay. Um, but it, it was very, very light when it first started. Okay. Um, I just had a little bit of urethral discomfort, okay. um, a little bit of vulvodynia, but okay. it didn't interfere with sex. It didn't interfere with my daily life. Okay. I went to a urologist and he was like, I think you have polyps in your urethra. He did a little camera up there and looked in the office. 
Okay. And um, I was like, okay, well, that's weird. Um, and he just kind of probably gave me some antibiotics, sent me on my way. But I kind of, I never really got better. Um, and then several years later, um, this was the end of 2017. Okay. Um, I started to get worse. Okay. Um, yeah, significantly worse. I went back to um, the same doctor who was horrible, uh, very old school. Um, okay. And he basically just, uh, well, my primary care doctor found the urea plasma and bacterial vaginosis. So we thought, oh, it's urea plasma. That's it. That's the smoking gun. So she put me on antibiotics. I wasn't getting better, but I tested negative for the urea plasma months later. Um, but they just overloaded me with antibiotics. Let's try this antibiotic. Let's try this one. And eventually my bladder started hurting. It moved to my bladder. It wasn't even in my bladder. Okay. And now my bladder hurts. Um, and then just from now on, it's just gotten just worse. Okay. And does your pain get worse as your bladder fills with urine? And it, does it feel better after you pee? Yes. Okay. It did not used to do that. Okay. So, um, again, I, I guess as you were talking, the first thing that I wanted to talk about was the fact that your symptoms started with a little bit of vulvodynia and a little bit of urethral pain, right? Right. So if we look at our model, I'm going to, I'm going to take off the levators and what you can see here are the muscles which impact the urethra and the muscles which impact the vulva. And so we now really believe that vulvodynia is often driven by tight muscles that are squeezing nerves that, affect, that are affecting the skin of the vulva. Okay, so, uh, and there are research studies that support that pelvic floor physical therapy is remarkably successful at reducing vulvodynia symptoms. So that's clue number one that we have to be aware of. And clue number two is the urethra, because if these muscles are tight, it's gonna hurt your urethra. And sometimes it feels like, you know, back in the old days, granted I'm a wee bit older than you, I first had urethral pain when I was in junior high, seventh grade. And I, I couldn't sit through class. So I had frequency and urgency, no pain, just frequency, urgency. I just couldn't sit through class. And the doctor, mm -hmm. the teachers got upset, yada, yada, yada. Go to the gyneco go to the urologist. And I was diagnosed with a urethral stricture, which meant my urethra was narrow. And it did feel narrow. It felt like I was trying to pee through a needle sometimes. It was definitely narrow. Yes. I know the feeling. <laughs> okay. So back then, what they used to do was they would do a urethral dilation where they put a met piece of metal in your urethra, progressive. Well, for me, it was just one, a big piece and they would uh, put lidocaine on it and they would just shove it in there and you'd take a deep breath and gas and they'd pull it out and it would stretch out your urethra. But they never asked, why is the urethra narrow? And the reason why the urethra is narrow is because of tight muscles, right? And so today, there was a, there was a, a couple of years ago, it's at a big national urology event, and an international doctor asked, I think the IC panel, do you perform urethral dilations? And the doctor answered, no, we don't rape the urethra anymore. They consider that raping the urethra. So you're kind of, you're clicking off, you're clicking off subtle symptoms of pelvic floor tension. So the next okay. question is, when you have a gynecological exam, does it hurt? Yes. Okay. How about intimacy? Is intimacy painful? Um, it can be kind of half the time, okay. especially if I'm not turned on enough. If I'm turned on enough, it's fine. If I'm not, ouch. Okay. And um, throw in the scoliosis. Now right. I, I have an S curve. What, what is your curve? Yeah. You have an S, S curve? curve. Okay. Yeah. So it's like the upper back and then of course 
at the lower back, if I stand uh -huh. for too long, um, I actually can bend over and it just cracks. It just crunches down there, the lower spine. Yeah. So I can't stand very long because it's like putting pressure really? on the lower back. Wow. Do you, yeah. know, do you know what the curve is? What the, what the, um, the curve is? I can show you mine. Let me see. Yeah. See, my back is, it's like, yeah, it's like, like that. <laughs> okay, if I bend over, you can see that one side of my back is higher than the other. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's my scoliosis. And it's a, it's a perfectly balanced, thank God, it's a perfectly balanced S curve. I'm supposed to be an inch taller. And it's, it, it manifests mostly like my waist is here. It, I, I should, my waist should be a little bit lower, but that's really, it's just right. kind of like from here to here. Well, S, S, like that. S. Uh, okay. And so the question is, then is, why is my SI joint screwed up? And the answer comes back to that my hips are not perfectly level because of my scoliosis. Right. And so that may be why the SI joint over time developed some issues. Uh, we don't know. I right. mean, that's that's just a guess. That's just a guess. Are they going to are they doing anything with your. So, so I was really. Oh, uh, God. What was I just reading? I was just reading. You know, they've made a lot of really good advances with with scoliosis, too. And there's a, a new uh, workout where they actually. You know, when you have an S curve, when you have a curve, the muscles on the inside of the curve are contracted and the muscles on the outside of the curve are stretched out, right? They're supposed to be right. like this, but when you're curved, these muscles on this side are tight and these muscles on this side are stretched out. And so there's a, a whole bunch of new scoliosis things that are kind of happening right now that I think you might find interesting. And okay. I, I would encourage you to look at that. So the question now is, why is your bladder acting up? And that in all likelihood is what we would call the somatovisceral reflex, that your muscles have been tight for a long time, you know, potentially a very long time. Um, you, you're, you have symptoms associated with muscle tension um, and tight muscles restrict blood flow and tight muscles damage nerves or they make it hard mm -hmm. for nerves nerves to function normally. And he talks about this in this book. You need to get this book. This will yeah. help you and it will give you context. And as you read it, I want you to read it with the thinking about your body and how your body is built. Listen, we can't change that we have scoliosis. I, it just right. is what it is. It just, it's just, we don't even know why scoliosis happens to a certain, certain extent, but it does. But what we can do is compensate for it with muscle health. Like the thing that helped me the most with my scoliosis was swimming. Oh my God. Did you ever do, you know, listen, backstroke. Whoa. Just this, oh, yeah. just this motion alone. I call it dry swimming, laying on your back and you're swimming like this, like on the floor. This motion of being up like that. I don't know about you, but my back loves that. Yeah, you should you should try that. It feels so good. So anyway, and I also um, had Rocky Mountain spotted fever, supposedly sure. seven years ago, which oh. was before these symptoms started, okay. um, which I know that can attack your nerves. But I didn't have bladder problems when I actively was very sick. Um, but I did have panic attacks when I started getting better uh -huh. um, as I would go to sleep. So subconsciously I was holding a lot of anxiety. Uh -huh. um, and I don't know if that maybe contributed because people are like, Oh, have you been sexually assaulted because your pelvic floor is ridiculous. And I'm like, no, but I mean, I went through a trauma where I thought I was dying, you know, you know um, I, I, it's same man, stress is stress. And when you're under stress, you tighten muscles. I mean, we're under stress right, right. now with fires. It is what it is. It's not our fault. You didn't do anything wrong. You're not making any of this up. It's not in your head. It's real. Um, um, it, and it's our job to learn better coping, you know, anxiety management. That's hard when you're young. I had a ton of anxiety when I was young and especially in my twenties. I really regret not taking 
uh, anxiety management class early. If so, if you're still struggling with it, find a class and take it completely changed my life. And I haven't had a panic attack since I took my class. And it just took mm -hmm. it away from being an embarrassment to, oh, yeah, look, the first lottery winners in my state of California were in the same class because winning the lottery gave them massive anxiety, you know, because people, right. people started following them. So, you know, learning anxiety skills is good. But fundamentally, it's, it's, it's about muscles and bones and organs and how they interrelate with each other. And mm -hmm. um, are you doing anything for your pelvic floor? Okay, so I went to pelvic floor physical therapy, yeah. which I'm living in Nashville now. I wasn't in, in Kentucky. So we have better doctors here. Um, but my insurance just really sucks. Um, when I found out I had urea plasma parvum, and then I found out that I'm positive again for Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is weird after seven years. Wow. Um, so I've been working. So I'm like, okay, let's stop physical therapy because kind of like, like you were saying earlier, they were kind of just doing stretches and stuff. And I'm like, this is, I'm spending all this money. It's not helping me. And I was like, let me make sure it's not an infection or it's not contributed to Rocky Mountain in some way. And then we'll get back into physical therapy. Um, when I went to the Lyme doctor, he was like, yeah, like your bands, you have bands for Lyme. You've got Rocky Mountain. He's like, it's weird. It's really weird that you don't have Rocky Mountain symptoms. I'm like, no, it's literally just my bladder. Like everything else is fine. And he's like, you haven't responded to antibiotics. So he's ran a bunch of blood work, which is not back yet about like mast cells and all this, all this other stuff. Yeah. Um, but he really doesn't think it's attributed to the Lyme or anything. He thinks it's completely separate, which I kind of agree. And he's like, since you've never responded to antibiotics at all, let's just go a different route and probably get you back into physical therapy, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, um, I think you need again. to, I, if I were you, I would want to have a next generation urine test. And I did it. I had a microgen. Is that the same thing? Yeah. What did it find? Okay. Uh, um, in the vaginal area, it had some, um, I think I'd like, I think it was strep and some stuff like that. Okay. Um, so I did take some, um, you know, antibiotics for that. But in the bladder itself, I only had E. coli in the urine. Okay. Um, this only thing they found, once I got rid of that, they did have, I had a high level of lactobacillus. Well, And I say high, I don't, you know, they're saying I could have an overgrowth of that. But I had my mom take it. I was like, mom, you do it. And let's see what your lacto is. And hers was like 100% lactobacillus crispitus. Well, yeah, and mine was like 92. Okay, but lactobacillus is part of, it's a normal part of the vaginal biome. Um, but there are okay. different types of lactobacillus. So, so lactobacillus gasseri, which starts with a G, can be a pathogenic bacteria for the, in the urinary tract. Whereas the other lactobacillus, okay. we would expect to find that to a certain degree, that all those tissues are generally populated with lactobacillus. So it's a combination of what, do the, what does the test show combined with your symptoms? You know, we asked, I interviewed right. Rick, the, the CEO of Microgen, and I said, how do, you, how, do you, how do you know when to treat? You know, I mean, if a patient is asymptomatic, but they come out with E. coli, do you treat it? And he said, no, you don't. It's about what the symptoms are, which show, which is showing active infection combined with what the test results are showing. Um, right. So Rocky Mountain spotted fever is a bacterial disease. Lyme disease is a bacterial disease. We know we have found Lyme disease Borrelia in the bladder. Uh, we know that many Lyme disease patients have active bladder symptoms from that bacteria. Um, right. But the, the next gen test didn't find it. Uh, do, do they test for that? Well, is that is Lyme tested in microgen? Well, I, I the, the the more appropriate question is does does Lyme get released into urine? How deep right. is it? And I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. That would be a really good question to ask. Well, you're you know, hon, you're 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 a mystery. You are. We've got two clear issues. Your muscles are effed up. I know that for a fact. Yeah. And we know that. The question is why? Is it because of your scoliosis or is it because your muscles have gone into a guarding reflex because of your infections? That's that's the right. simple question. And and see when I, I went to the um 
I went to a uh, urogyno here in Nashville and she did a pelvic exam. Yeah. And at first she goes, I really want you to check for diverticulum before I had the MRI. And she's like, it does feel a little odd. So I do think I do kind of want to check for the skin gland route just in case that's maybe something. I don't know. Well, I mean, so, so we had a patient, it's very, very interesting, who was diagnosed with IC. Went through therapy for many years, nothing worked, her, and she went to doctor, 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 and finally a nurse practitioner listened to her, and she kept saying it hurts here by my urethra, and they ordered a three-dimensional uh, CAT scan, either CAT scan or I always forget which one it is, and they and it was that three-dimensional picture which found a diverticulum immediately under her urethra like they were like this and it was exactly right. the length of her urethra it was coming it was coming off of her urethra and when they went in and surgically removed it her symptoms disappeared so it was a mystery she had no idea how it formed you know diverticulum often formed from pressure so this somebody straining, you know, it, but it, it might've been a birth defect. We just don't know, you know? Right. So getting checked for something like that is reasonable, but I, okay. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you're more like me in terms of having an, an imbalance in your hips because of the scoliosis and you have to have a reality check about your expectations with physical therapy. Because physical therapy is about training muscles. And until they understand why your muscles are screwed up, you have to continue to work with those muscles. Do you have an internal wand? Are you using a wand to try to? Um, they gave me one. Um, uh -huh. I used it some. It's like it's more like plastic, though, and just kind of like a basic, really small. So this is... I mean, so this is the wand that I use, and this is the wand that, that we sell. We have, well, there are three of them. So this is a company, this is a company called IC Relief. And I, I will say that before I read this book, I had no clue what I was doing. It's kind of like you push it in, you put it in there, and you're kind of pushing things, and you just really don't get it. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, I feel like I don't want to do it. <laughs> I know. I know. And what this book did is it helped me understand where the muscles were and, and how to move around them. And so as an example, if we look at this, I mean, you can see that these muscles are flat along the bone, right? And so, right. so when you're using... Uh, a wand, there's a J shape. You're going up the side. It, and my my physical therapist kept saying, do a J. And I'm like, what the hell is a J? And I tried, yeah, I, like, like, I don't get it. I, I, I do not understand what the J is. And then finally, finally, after reading the book, it was like, okay. And so I've got my, I don't, I don't know if I can show this to you. I've got my wand in there and I'm just moving it along the J. There's a real J shape in there. But I don't think you can do that easily with a straight wand. I think you need the curved wand a little mm -hmm. bit more. Um, now, um, what I find so interesting is while my day-to-day -day pain is on my left butt cheek, when I do my internal work, internally, it's the right side that's sore. Isn't that strange? I know. I know. And again, I think, I think that that's a reflection of, of well, anyway, uh, don't give up on that, especially as a scoliosis patient. You've got to try to, you know, I would do like once every two days for a month, just to kind of map where your tension is, you know? Right. I mean, it's just, it's just, inter it takes five minutes. It's super, but it's interesting. I mean, it's just, right. I just find it very, very interesting. And, and, and one question I have too about it is um, I've noticed a lot of, of people when they're on their period, they feel worse. Mm -hmm. My last period I had actually felt 
better while I was menstruating? Is that a pelvic floor? Do, do your pelvic floor relax during your menses? Well, you're so, so your muscle behavior changes with your, with your period. Definitely. Definitely. There'll be moments when it is weaker uh, or looser and then moments when it is tighter based upon estrogen levels. I think, although if I'm wrong and there's physical therapists in the room, please educate me. But I, pretty sure I remember reading something like that. One of my favorite websites is pelvicpainrehab.com. Pelvicpainrehab.com. Guys, everybody watching this, pelvic pain, hold on, let me just go there and make sure I didn't screw it up. Um, hold on. Yeah, I uh, know. Yeah. Pelvicpainrehab.com is the best blog on pelvic floor issues on the web. Their blog is fantastic. And they run uh, pelvic floor um, um, offices throughout California and also in Connecticut, I think. Um, and they may have just opened another office somewhere else. But if anybody's talked about it, they've talked about it. And also the um, one of the CEOs, Stephanie Pendergrast, who's a physical therapist down in LA, uh, is awesome on Twitter. Stephanie Pendergrast and Elizabeth Rummer, if you can follow them on Twitter, their, their articles are fantastic. Um, I'm just, I've learned so much from them and um, uh, I've reprinted some of their work. So, you know, I want you to have a reality check with the muscles. I, 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 you know, when you say it didn't help, that's what you have to say is, are my muscles uh, uh, less tight? It might okay. not have helped your, your bladder symptoms because we're not there yet. But if your muscles are responding to therapy and they're getting less tight, that is, a, that is an important first sign. Okay. 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 And I guess, um, I guess one other question is, I mean, how do you feel about urea plasmas? Do you really feel like that could be a culprit or do you think it's kind of like a, just kind of, it's not really the real problem? Interestingly, AUA this year, let me see if I can find it. Um, hold on a sec. Let me see. Let me just go through this real quick. I swear I saw a new study. Let's hold on. Let me do find. Let me just search. I got this giant document here of all the research studies. Let me just search for urea plasma. Yes. Yes. I was right. Okay. I might be six years old, but my memory's still there. Hallelujah, baby. Okay, so this was a, and let's see, let me make sure there, there is not another reference to a urea plasma. Okay, hold on. Okay, so this was a paper, a uh, research study that came out of Korea. And I think you'll find it very interesting. The title of it was a urea plasma parvum infection in females with microscopic hematuria, the potential association with chronic urethral pain and even infertility. And so let's look at this for a moment. Do you know the name of your urea plasma? Was it urea plasma parva, parvum? I had both. So I had, I don't think I was tested for parvum before. So I, now when I did my microgen, I did a urine and a vaginal swab. Neither one of them came back with um, urea plasmas. But okay. when I tested positive for Rocky Mountain again, I'm like, I want to be tested for urea plasmas again, negative for your reticulum, what I originally had, and was positive for parvum. And I'm just like, okay, well now I've had two different types. Okay. Is my immune system just not working? I mean, it's like no, it's just it's a hard infection, and it's a it's a very difficult to culture infection too. So let me read this to you. Um, inner urea plasma parvum is a pleomorphic cell wall deficient microorganism commonly found in the genital urinary tract of females, often resulting in microscopic hematuria with or without urethral pain. 
The study aimed to evaluate the prevalence of urea plasma and distribution of urea plasma cerebars, as well as a possible associating, association with urethral pain and micros, microscopic hematuria. Guys, this is, this is lab speak. So what did they do? They went to 276 female patients who had microscopic hematuria between 21 and 68. Uh, they did uh, basically, micro, they did PCR testing with a vaginal swab and urine samples. Uh, they treated them with uh, five commercially available antibiotics um, initial, and then they did testing it initially and then at one month and three months after treatment was finished. Okay, the prevalence of urea plasma among microscopic hematuria patients was 18%. Um, among the urea plasma positive patients, 70, 80% were co-present with vaginal. The urea plasma in these uh, were 80% were resistant to azithromycin, 100% were re resistant to erythromycin, and 96% were resistant to Cipro. Doxycycline worked for all of them. So all of these patients underwent a treatment of doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for one week. At one month post-treatment, all patients were negative for both urine, were negative in both urine and vaginal. At three months, all six had a recurrence of urea plasma. This part of this, the part of the study, I just don't understand. Okay, so if you want, I can I can email you this study. You can give it to your doctor. It's okay. inter it's interesting, um, especially the drug resistance part is interesting. Um, so what what antibiotic did they put you on for it? Um, well, my gyno, because I told him to run it, um, and my gyno said, oh, this bacteria is, like, really common. It doesn't even cause urinary symptoms. Like, there's no reason to treat it. But, yeah, I can treat you if you've got urinary symptoms, like, if you want. Okay. And plus, I've got Rocky Mountain, which Rocky Mountain you treat with doxycycline. So I'm like, well, if I've got Parvum and Rocky Mountain, let's just do, like, a month of doxycycline and just uh, do that. So I did, um, which my stomach was not tolerating the doxy well. So... I did about three weeks of doxycycline. Some days I just did one pill instead of two though, because it was just too much. Okay. Um, but I have not retested yet because it's only been like, it was only been like two months ago okay. I was treated. Okay. Well, you're in a pickle. I mean, you're, you're in a pickle with that. Yeah. You know, urea plasma, mycoplasma are definitely more, more difficult. They're, I read a paper on it like last year and, there was a specific reason why it was a bit more challenging. I don't remember what it is. I could, I could dig it out for you. I mean, I, it just would take me a little bit to find it, but I think following that line of pathway makes sense too. I think it makes sense too, but don't abandon your muscle work because I know I feel like doctors are just kind of divided on it. Like well, some of them think, Oh, yeah. it causes some of them like, don't believe it's just nothing, you know? Well, the reality is your symptoms. I mean, the, what you've just got to say then is why do I have these symptoms? We're trying to figure out right. why do I have these symptoms? The most, the only pathogen we're identifying is urea plasma. Here is a study which also asso associated urea plasma with blood in my urine and urethral pain. So do you have urethral pain? Yeah, that's my main symptom. Okay, so yeah. I want you to email me and I will copy you this study. I will cut and paste you the study that you can give that you can give to your doctors. Okay. 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 All right, hon. Well, listen, it was wonderful to talk to you and I want to absolutely stay in touch hundred percent for sure. Want to stay in touch and hear how you're doing. And if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to try to dig any more information up for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, I hope I helped a little bit. I hope I helped a little yeah, bit. You did. Good, good, good. Okay. I'll see you. And we're going to go to.
our last person, which is Sarah. Wait, okay. Oh, I'm trying to unmute Sarah. I'm trying, Sarah. Okay, okay. I think she said one second. <laughs> okay, I'll have a drink of water. And Facebook, YouTube would be coming back to you. Okay, I can't hear you, hun, because you're muted. Oh, there. I you. just did my fourth. I just did my fourth um, Kenalog uh, steroid clinical trial uh, bladder installation last week. Um, it was it was pretty rough. Um, I didn't know that when you start, when I would start to trigger injections, though, um, that it would begin to be my my pelvic floor. I guess my pelvic regions have it's just been a whole lot different than I'm than I'm used to. Okay, so, so is it does it take a long time before you get those trigger injections that it's supposed to help? Well, you so you're you're talking about two or three different things. So I got to make sure I understand what you're saying. <laughs> So what you said is that you're participating in some sort of research study involving a steroid injection. Okay. With, it's a, it's a with the bladder installation. Okay. So with a bl bladder okay. installation added with Kenalog. Okay. So it's just a straight fluid that they're putting. So they're not injecting your bladder wall with a needle. Yeah, but I'm putting it in my bladder for 60 minutes. Okay, but you're not, it's not a, like a Botox injection where there's a needle injecting no. a steroid into the middle no. of a lesion. Okay, so it's a no. bladder installation. Okay. Yes. Um, hold on a sec. Let me just see if we can find, I want to find the trial. Hold on a sec. It's, it's Louisville University in Kentucky. And it's a, it's the trial for interstitial cystitis. Yes, ma'am. What's the name? Um, Elise Abraham, and I actually found her on your IC network uh, database of doctors. Okay, hold on a sec. It's UFL physicians. What's uh, do they have a specific name for it for the medication? That's put into the. Yeah. I have I'll have oh, it's I in my it. I found it documentation. No, I got it. I got it. I got okay. it. It's a clinical trial comparing two bladder installations for ICBPS with triamcinolone and without triamcinolone. And it's being done at the University of Louisville Urogynecology. All right, let's take a look at this real quick. So we've got 80 people in the study. It's randomized. You don't know what you got. Some patients are getting six bladder installations of the stand of a heparin lidocaine instill with triamcinolone. And then some patients are getting the instill without the triamcinolone. And they're measuring your symptoms. okay okay so you've had your fourth so what happened with your fourth treatment tell us what happened um uh the fourth treatment um i'm getting more retention than i normally do but i don't know if it's the retention is because of the trigger injections because every week i have an installation and every other week i have an installation and trigger injections and where are the trigger injections happening uh, in all four four, four wall, they happen. On, they're happening on the bottom, and then on both sides, and then up top of your bladder or your pelvic floor. Inside of my vagina. So you're having pelvic floor trigger points along with blood. Okay. 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 Yeah, it's been pretty rough, and it, it's also been pretty rough for the fact that. Uh, I had my kids with me 24 seven and the simple fact coronavirus prevents you from bringing your children with you. So right. I would normally have my toddlers with me. I'll also need a driver because I'm not able to drive myself 
And as soon as you get that installation and the trigger injections, you're not able to control your urination. You will automatically just urinate on yourself. Really? There's, I basically have no control over it whatsoever. But at this point in time, I don't have any control over my my urinating at all. I take I take four doses of botanical a day for um and uh, two doses of Flomax a day. So I don't have to cat self catheterize. When did this start for you? When did this uh, all start we, for you? When did the the retention start? Well, or we did any the of IC it. Start? When did any of it start? When did you first start having bladder problems? Well, um, I started having bladder. I think I I started having the bladder symptoms. It was just urethra burning, you know, at like around age fifteen. And then I was diagnosed with IC through the cystoscope by my gynecologist um, when I was 21. And were you told? And I'm 31 you, now. Okay. And were you told that you had Hunter's lesions when you were 21? No, I didn't. wasn't told I had Hunter's lesions until uh, I was 27, actually. So you actually have confirmed Hunter's lesions. Okay. Uh, well, as she was talking about earlier, like it was cauterized one time and it went away. But how come that isn't in my case? Why does it seem that there's more every time they go back in? Well, you're, you're mixing apples and oranges here to a certain extent. And that is we have to differentiate what they're doing for your bladder versus what they're doing for your pelvic floor. So let's separate those for a moment and let's just think about what they're doing for your bladder so right now you're getting you're getting a rescue installation with heparin and lidocaine and and either triamcinolone or or you may or may not also have triamcinolone in that so is that going to cause retention um, I already had retention to begin with, but on the days that I get my trigger injections, those are the days where the retention is the um, it where it's. What does the doctor what say? What? How does the doctor explain you having more retention after you have, after you have the trigger point injections? What does the doctor say about that? She said sometimes it takes a long time for the muscles to loosen after they've been tightened for so long. But that doesn't explain the incontinence. I, I, I don't understand why you're incontinent after you're having it. I always take my medicine to help me urinate because I don't have a frequency problem. You know, I've never had a frequency issue at all. Um, because I guess when I started having those pains as I was so younger, I started to, to control when I was going to the bathroom. Uh, you know, you were in school, middle school, high school comes along and, you know, you can't go to the bathroom in every single class, you know. And every time you go to the doctor, you're going to a pediatrician and they're saying there's just blood in the urine and nothing else. So as I got older, it was just always blood in the urine and there was no bacteria. Okay. You know, a couple okay. of times I would have bacteria, but other than that, it was just blood in the urine. So remember what I talk about. I always say that we have the chicken versus the egg dilemma. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? And for us, it's which comes first, the bladder or the pelvic floor. The, they're both involved. Your, uh, your pelvic floor is obviously messed up if they're giving you trigger point injections. Right. So when you had your pelvic floor exam, what did they find? I couldn't walk the next day, to be honest. She barely even touched me down there. OK, so that's OK. So I call that the hallelujah moment. Because if they touch you and it triggers pain, then we found it. That's really good information. That's really important information. The fact that you went and have a pelvic floor assessment, you barely touch your muscles, and you could barely. I feel like I just had another kid, is how I felt. Okay. I feel like I just went too late. Okay, but, but see, that's good news because that tells us your pelvic floor is massively screwed up. So the question is, why? Now, how many kids have you had? I have three. Okay. And um, how did the deliveries go? Um, 
The first one uh, didn't go so well, but um, How I'm a petite you? person. Okay. I was 18. I planned all my children. Okay. I was 18 when I had my first one, and um, um, I was 100 pounds on all three of my pregnancies when I began. Um, so I was 100 pounds. I gained 153 pounds. I made it to 35 weeks, and my placenta quit feeding on him, and I had him. But during the delivery, um, uh, during the delivery process, no matter how hard I pushed, it felt like I just couldn't get him out. So they they used the vacuum to remove him. And, they sucked him out. And, yeah. and did you sustain damage from that? Did you? I, I had a third degree tear. If that's what you're wondering. All right. I do have vulvaginia also too, and yeah, I have okay. the cream that you spoke of earlier. Okay. Okay. So. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Here is our first example of a really significant pelvic floor trauma. Now, prior to having your kids, well, you said you roller had a, skating. You, roller skating. That was the most, and I was a cheerleader and a track, and I ran track also. Okay. Okay. So, with contextually, what we have is a series of pelvic floor injuries that tweaked your pelvic floor over and over and over again. You were, you were a roller skater. You absolutely fell roller skating onto your tailbone, I'm sure, many times. My dad could skate backwards, you know. You born in 59, you grew up in the 70s, you can really outskate somebody. I mean, I really tried to do what he could do, but I never could. I just fell. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then you have your first child, and you suffer a third-degree tear. That's major they also forgot to turn the epidural off on me because that had to be induced because of my placenta stopped feeding him they they had to they forgot to turn the epidural off and they had done removed my uh catheter and by the time that they did turn the epidural off i still hadn't urinated like eight hours and you know i had been had that iv the whole entire time after i had him so that was the first time I had ever experienced bladder spasms. Right, your bladder. And I thought was, I, was, I literally I was throwing stuff at people. Yeah, your I was going insane over it. Yeah, your bladder was being you. You suffered a hydrodistension. You had a clear, which is yet another bladder trauma. So you know, I I always like to go back to day one. I think day one is very very meaningful, and I think a patient's intuition as to what they felt triggered their symptoms is meaningful information. And you were falling a lot, you were doing gymnastics, you were running, and your first symptom you had was a little bit- Burning of, of the urethra. Burning of like the urethra. Like I had a UTI. Like I always had a UTI. Right, okay. And so again, the urethra, I've got a great blog on our website, icnetwork.com, the seven causes of urethral pain. But when we consider, I was holding it upside down, when we consider that the urethra goes through the levator muscles, the, the bottom level of, you got three layers of muscles, a shallow, mid, deep. The shallowest layers basically have three holes in them. What makes the pelvic floor and the levator muscles so Unique is that they directly influence three critical body functions, your ability to pee, your ability to have a bowel movement, and your ability to have sex. And you can see from this also, picture. Do you think this, uh, that pelvic floor dysfunction, it also controls both of the um, reproductive organs that, you know, your ovaries, like only one of my ovaries ovulate. No. Uh, and, it, no. and that's it. No. That's uh, do you think pelvic floor dysfunction can cause uh, infertility in women? Possibly. Possibly. Okay. Can it control? Can it make it to where birth control doesn't work, or your periods are not regular no. and no. heavy or light? No, that's all hormonally driven. We're just talking structures right now. It's so it, apples, apples and oranges. Like, you got apples and oranges. I was here. thinking like. They say that the muscle's blood flow is restricted. So does that mean the blood flow is restricted to those organs also to cause those organs not to I, work? Uh, I guess I'm misunderstanding I don't, that. I don't, 
I don't think it would affect. I, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, you're. It's possible. I, 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 it would be a really good question for a really good gynecologist. What are the long-term ramifications? And you know what? Hold on a sec. Let's just go to the expert right here. Hold on a sec. Let's just see. Madonna Bible? Yeah. Uh, no, this is breaking through chronic pelvic pain. You know, there are, if you, if you have super, super painful periods, if you've got really heavy bleeding, if you've got polycystic yeah. ovarian syndrome where you're, you've got uh, multiple cysts popping, that's hormonally driven. That does not relate to muscles. Muscles involve well, structures. I think, that, I think that my RC has, I think my, my RC is the worst it is and I have the most amount of pain whenever I have my menstrual cycle. Well, that's because hormones influence the bladder wall. You know, I mean, you're... The, the bladder and the reproductive tract and the vulva and the labia all come from something called the, the um, urogenital sinus. So when we are just a, a little tiny cluster of cells in our mom's belly, there's one cell that differentiates that becomes the, the bladder and the urethra and the vulva and the vagina. And that's why these organs are also dependent on estrogen. They're very dependent and influenced by changes in estrogen. Um, and so let's just, uh, I'm not, I'm trying the Mirena and it, the IUD birth control to try to try to stop my periods and it didn't work. I, and now I'm trying the depo shot and I, the only thing it's given me was my period. I've been on my period since June the 11th. I've taken three shots and it still not stopped my period at all. I mean, you clearly have. A, 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 a hormonal issue. There's no doubt about it. If you had a period for three months, then we know something is, is dysfunctional there. It, does that relate to your muscles? I don't think so, but I, I'm, that's a question for your doctor. I don't necessarily understand how tight muscles would cause a long-term period. I don't understand the biology of how that could possibly happen. I don't think it is, but I, I'm, that's not my area of expertise. I, understand. Um, I was thinking that. I wasn't told that by anyone. I was yeah. just wondering why my periods are the way that they are. Well, that could but be genetic. You get the weak, you know, the endo and uh, I see are like wicked twisted systems, you know. They are. They are and they the doctor told me that after she does the trigger injections, if if my if my bladder can't work on its own, she wants to go in laparoscopically to look for endo. I, I, you know, your case is very complex. You're doing a lot of different things at the same time. I, I, I'm, I'm surprised you're in the research study since you're having the trigger point injections because to me that would make it very difficult to evaluate the success. I'm also on my period too. So well, the whole entire time I'm being in this in this in this trial, I'll be the patient that's been on her period yeah, the whole entire yeah, time. Yeah, I, I, I think that that your contribution to the trial is going to be very difficult to interpret. It's going to be very difficult for them to interpret your data, that's for sure. Well, again, I think that in a case like yours, you it's, it's best to, rather than looking at it as a big whole big mess, let's just break it into individual small workable pieces here. So it, workable piece number one is that your muscles are screwed up and they're tight. And so doing things that will help those muscles relax makes total sense. And then the, the next important question is what structurally is wrong with your muscles to the point that if she even touched your muscles, you could barely walk the next day. I mean, I literally felt like I, I had done being through labor again. Like I my know, hips, I, I, it was my hips, the, my she, hips and my tailbone. Well, so, so, you know, you just raised the thing that I was just going to raise. And that is, is there something dysfunctionally wrong with your bony structures that is putting way too much stress on your pelvic floor. That's not normal. There's nothing normal about what you've gone through here. And most people, I mean, 
most people do not have a reaction to the degree that you did, which tells me that getting a closer look at your anatomy and why your muscles are uh, and what your muscles are doing not the whys, but the what's almost. It's like, okay, is it the left side or the right side? Is it the piriformis or is it the obturator? Is it the levator? I, you know, a really important piece of this puzzle is to try to figure out what did she touch that triggered your pain? Number one. And then number two, why are your muscles so tight? What is it in your pelvis that is keeping your muscles tight? Is it pain? Is it a long-term prolonged guarding reflex because of endo? Or is there something structurally wrong with your body anyway from a tailbone injury or a bony structure injury or how you walk or a hip or a knee? I mean, these are all relevant, important questions. You've had three children, you had a major injury with, with at least one childbirth, you've had a couple of pretty big falls. I suffered more on my last delivery than I did at all. They, they decided to make a new law that uh, but if you are not 38 weeks, they cannot assist you or induce your labor in any shape, way, way or form now unless you are past 38 weeks. And since I have my children before 38 weeks, I have my second child the day I turned 37 weeks. Um, I labored at the hospital and was sent home to labor at home at five centimeters. So... Um, because I wasn't 38 weeks, they would not uh, help me. So I, I, I stayed in the hospital like 15 hours and they sent me home and told me, you'll just have to labor at home because we can't even, we can't help you because you're three days away from being 38 weeks. You know, I there's no you, way we can help. Our you. government has no business in, in women's decisions like this. This is a decision that has to be made by a doctor and a patient, not some stupid bureaucrat. It was big. My doctor was on vacation and I was stuck with midwives. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen. I, it was three days before I had him and I was even three days after that, I was still at five centimeters with contractions every day, two minutes apart for the next three days. I mean, literally. I mean, it wasn't fair, stunning. but stunning. Those are the law of regulations. It's because uh you in the US we have one of the highest maternal mortality rates that there is in any uh, developing country like we are. Oh, like, man, do not even get me started. It's just that ridiculous. That damage to my pelvic floor, too, because it stayed so far down in there. I mean, I could feel his head. Okay, you know? but the good, news, the good news is, is that muscles respond beautifully to muscle therapy. The problem is, is you don't know what your injury is. And until they understand your injury, that that's challenging and the fact that they're doing the trigger points tells me that they're kind of throwing everything they can at it and that makes sense uh i don't understand why you're incontinent because of it i that that's baffling to me i had retention before i started the trigger injections and i had retention before this i started having retention about two summers ago all of a sudden every time i would go to urinate no, i just only a little bit would come out and then it, no matter how hard i pushed i just couldn't push the pee out and you and you're not supposed and you know you're not supposed to push that when you push you just and you're not supposed to push so right, right then i'll go to the doctor and um he takes me off of my oxybutin okay but well, so the, but, like but, but okay, but that's important because oxybutynin is notorious for kind of deadening those muscles and making it hard to pay. So, so that was a good decision on his part to take you off of that because that would be a very logical connection between your, your, your urine. That happened to me at three months at oxybutynin, which is why I stopped it because it was getting harder and harder so, to pay. So I stopped oxybutynin, but the he kept telling me to stop pushing, stop straining, right. and stress your life, you know. So I, I went on a little mini vacation with my sisters, you know. We went down to St. Augustine in Florida and went on St. George Street, spent some time with my aunts. But, yeah, even these, even 
when you're a mom and you leave your kids, it's it's more stressful when you're gone than when you are with yeah. them. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, hon, listen. So, so we gotta we gotta wrap this up. This is what I would just say to you: is that you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. Your <laughs> your your muscles make no sense. You you have, I mean, in terms of your symptoms, we know your muscles are involved. We know you've sustained pretty significant muscle injury multiple times over the years, and having a comprehensive muscle assessment to try to figure out which of these muscle groups is messed up is important, right? Is it the left side? Is it the right side? Is it the low muscles? Is it the deep muscles? We, those are all relevant, important questions. Um, you can feel that, that kind of pain when you stand up, like kind of vibrates to your toes from your hip. Well, honey, Here's what I'm talking about. But that's a tight pair. That's usually a tight piriformis muscle squeezing a nerve. That's sciatica. And the trigger injections should eventually trigger those muscles to work correctly? Well, they, the trigger point injections might help reduce the trigger points, but it's the manual work to get the muscles functioning normally, again, that's equally as important. The trigger point injections are... are, are you tell me Kegels is the worst thing that I yes, could do. Yes, you would not do a Kegel. You're already too tight. This is about your muscles are like this. Your muscles are probably like this. The goal here is to get them to release. All a Kegel would do is tighten them up. We have to get them to release. And usually that's a finger in your vagina working on those muscles manually. Have you been able to do that at all? I've never tried that. Oh, no. That's like uh, in, in all the research study, the re what the research studies show is hands-on myofascial work is remarkably successful at reducing all of these symptoms. And so you're, you're looking for a quick fix. You're looking for a pill or a shot to make this go away. And you're not understanding that your muscles over time, I just don't know what to do now. They're hurt. And a, mu a hurt muscle becomes a tight muscle. And so how do we get that tightness to release? It's, it's like with the trigger point, if we got a tight muscle, we, we push on it to get, try to get it to release. Internally, it's about a, a finger working along the length of that muscle to try to get that muscle to flatten back down. I mean, I mean, these are flat muscles. I mean, I, I don't know if you can see that these are flat, shallow muscles. I wish I could, whoops. I wish I could show this to you a little bit more. It's so hard. It's hard I understand what you mean. I did watch some. I did. I did do some YouTube research. Watch some videos on pelvic floor muscles I, and how the nerves and the muscles and right, connect that, and how that, the missing, they work together. See, that's the missing piece here. That's the missing piece. So you need a proper, mm -hmm. thorough pelvic floor assessment, and then to at least try to understand your anatomy and what the hell is going on here. And a lot well, of she began physical therapy after I do my six weeks of trigger injections. Yeah, and I, I think I would add, I would also be asking, what do you want? What are you trying to accomplish with the trigger point injections? I mean, what's the goal of the trigger point injections? Do you know? Uh, to prevent the retention that I have, okay. to make my bladder go and urinate on its own where I don't have to catheter. So, or to, so, uh, then, so then the question that you would ask is, why do you think I'm retaining in the first place? Is it because my muscles are really tight or because I have a nerve? That's what okay. Okay. So she said, she, they said it was, you had retention because your muscles were tight, right? Is that what she yeah, said? Yeah, because I had pelvic floor dysfunction. Okay, the way so, that she explained it to me was your muscles are tight that keep that prevent your bladders uh, from working because the blood flow doesn't reach right okay, to those. Okay, so, 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 so your future, so the trigger points are like, the trigger point injections are just like a rapid, let's see what we can do to get these muscles to spontaneously relax, relax by giving them meds. But in the end, this is also about restoring function. Right now, your you, your muscles are not functioning normally, and that's where a finger in there going the length of the muscle is going to be really the most important piece of this here. 
I mean, talk to her about it. Talk to her about it. I think you just kind of, you kind of made a slight disconnect there. It's important. Your muscles have lost their muscle memory. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing. So they're compensating from all of your injuries by being super, super tight. And that's a problem here. And if it's so tight that you can't pee, we've got to get those muscles to behave normally. How do we do that with hands-on work and making sure there's nothing else there that could be causing it, like one leg longer than the other? So listen to the trigger injection guard to try to fix it now, trigger, but trigger also point. try to work on it later. Not to fix it, to help with it, to see if it will help. Maybe, it, right? it, it, maybe it'll help, but... Maybe they would also have you on a muscle, a little bit of a muscle relaxant, like Valium. Vaginal. They have me on Bacla, 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 the same kind of three times a day. And then that's the same kind of thing that they have for the vulvodynia, the gabapentin, and then um, vaginal suppositories, okay. and then uh, amitriptyline. So and you're, you're just missing, you, you're just not, you're not doing the one thing that's the most considered the most successful, which is the hands-on work on the muscles. Okay. So and the, pelvic that's the floor piece. therapy. Pelvic floor physical physical, therapy. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's where, I mean, we had the first research study in 2008. So National Institutes of Health study from many centers around the United States, which showed that internal pelvic floor myofascial massage was remarkably successful at reducing the symptoms of ice day. And so you're doing you're doing everything but the most important thing, which is the internal manual pelvic floor work. And it's probably it's, yeah, it's probably going to be challenging at first because it sounds like your muscles are really tight. Don't walk away from it. You've got they're, they're going to have to be slow well, and steady. The most challenging part is taking two toddlers with you while you're. I, I had to take them with me last week when I did my bladder yeah, installation. I, I, I know. In my that. double stroller. And I wasn't, and they're not even supposed to be with you, but I also had to drive myself because there's not, it's it's just not uh, available at this point in time for someone that's going to watch your children or I, I know. for you it, to it, have somebody well, and, to drive. And that's you. where if you could go at least once and if they can teach you how to use a wand, Maybe you can do more on your own at home also, right? Because that way I would have less doctor treatment. Right, right. But they would have, number one, they have to understand the scope of the problem. They have to figure out which muscles are involved. Number two, they've got to figure out what the right therapy is for that specific muscle group. And then they have to teach you how to do it. But they can do that in one appointment, potentially, you know. But that, that's exactly why, I, you know, we always say that, I have well, my next appointment on Wednesday, so Good. I'll ask. Me. Good. At least talk about it a little bit more. Well, listen, Sarah, I got to go. I probably gave you some ideas, some things to think about. You did. And, and, now you, and now bounce those ideas off of your physical therapist and see, if she, see what she has to say, okay? Okay. Thank All you. All right, huh? Nice Thank talking you with you. Today, by the way. Huh? It was a long that you had a long workout work work day. <laughs> I did, but I haven't been working as much because of the fire. So it's nice to be back in the saddle. Well, well, I hope the fires don't reach your house or anything. Uh, they're, uh, they're reaching our warehouse and my sister's house. The IC network operates in two locations. We operate out of my home because I'm caring for my elderly parents, and then our store is up on my sister's ranch and the fire is close. They're under mandatory evacuation and my staff are on mandatory evacuation. So we'll see. I have to, I have to look at the fire map. So anyway, all right guys. So I'm, I'm going to go back to Facebook and YouTube. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Nice uh, catching uh -huh. up with you. Bye-bye now. All right. Zoom is ending. Hello, Facebook. Hello, YouTube. I'm back. And look, we still have people. <laughs> we still have 10 people from YouTube and 20, 21 people from Facebook. So, you know, I, I, I just kind of want to talk about her, her story for a moment because, you know, some of you are very, very complex. You have very complex histories. You have very complex traumas. 
and you can see, you can, you know, you can, you can see how easy it is to get led, as, led astray. Here you've got symptoms of frequency, urgent. In fact, I was just, I was just talking to a patient who just had a baby four weeks post having a, no, no, no. Was it a baby or no? She either had a baby. Okay. No, 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 no. Yes. It might've been both. Okay. But this is something I see all the time. Like you've just had a baby and four weeks later, you've got frequency urgency. And the doctor is like, must be infection. They give you antibiotics, doesn't work. And nobody, they don't, they don't take a step back and go, well, you just had a baby. Could that have affected your pelvic floor muscles? And the answer is, oh my God, yes, 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 yes. But this is again, where Western medicine fails. They don't necessarily look at the connections between the two. And so she had major, major uh, muscle, muscle trauma and bladder trauma after two babies. And clearly that's probably playing a role, but it's that concept of repetitive trauma here. Whether it's bladder trauma or pelvic floor trauma, it's that repetitive trauma that I think is important. Kathy says, have people who've had COVID have flares? Um, we are doing a, a COVID IC study right now. And I will say that um, some patients with COVID are absolutely reporting uh, more intense flares and more intense pain. Uh, we have not uh, done anything. We don't have enough participants yet or patients who have had COVID to understand it a little bit more. Trudy says, I can't believe how much time you're putting to help us. Oh, thank you. Well, you just got a really good look, Trudy, at how I, I work with patients over the phone. My job is to open new doors and to educate. Uh, again, I'm, I, I can't give medical advice. It's not my place to give medical advice. My job is to try to give you a list of questions to ask your doctor and to try to help you understand the totality of what could be triggering some of these symptoms. Maria says, thank you for reaching out to us regarding the fires. We just got word, what? You're, you're being evacuated in Fremont? Is that the big, the big, the big fire down there? Or the, or the, that couldn't be the Santa Cruz fire. Ah, oh, Maria, I'm so sorry. Hi, David. Hi, Marianne. Hi, Connie. It's nice to see you. All right, guys. Well, listen, uh, we always do giveaways. Um, Hello, Andrea on YouTube. Hi, Nicole. Nicole says, yes, I strongly believe the stress can kickstart the pain cycle. Oh, man. Oh, hell yeah. It's looking a terrible job. Soaking a fire. <laughs> no more fires, please. No more fires. We don't want any more fires. So I have here... I have, uh, so what I'd like to do is um, the first two people who email me their snail mail address, I will send you a free bottle of the new aloe product called Allopath. So if you would like to try the new aloe product, this is organic anthraquinone free aloe combined with palmito ethanolamide for pain relief. So I believe that this is going to create a more calming, soothing, pain reducing aloe formula with the addition of PEA. And so this came out a couple weeks ago. We're really excited about it. And so if you would like a bottle of allopath, email me icnetwork at mac.com, your snail mail address, and I will send it out to you. Also, for anybody here, if I have some old issues of the IC Network magazine going back two, three, four, five, even 10 years, um, if you would like a couple of our old magazines or more, I'm, sometimes I'm sending people seven or eight because I don't want to recycle them. I want to give them away. They're good. There's good information in there. If you would like a packet of old magazines where you can read articles on IC, I would be happy to do that. I need you to, again, send me your snail mail address to icnetwork at mac.com. icnetwork at mac.com.
So last call for questions, last call for questions. I'm going to give you homework. Here's your homework for 15 minutes a day. I need you to do something for your spirit to calm yourself, whether it is, um, oh, there you go. I got my first email, Kathy Anglin. Girl, you're getting one of them. Um, do something that will give your spirit some comfort, whether it is sitting out in the sunshine, watching butterflies fly by, like one just flew by right there, or um, walking through the redwoods or going to church. Do something that will give you a little bit of peace and tranquility. For 15 minutes a day, I need you to do something for your body, for your, for your muscles or your bladder. Uh, Joyce says, I recently purchased a bottle of Bladder Builder and have taken it for five days. It already seems to be helping. Yeah, baby. That's because Bladder Builder is the first supplement that contains chondroitin for the bladder wall combined with PEA for the pain, redu pain reduction. So we're very happy with Bladder Builder. I think it's the best supplement on the market right now. I do. Um, uh, so for 15 minutes a day, you're going to do something, do your pelvic floor work or your stretches or follow the diet, whatever. For 15 minutes a day, I need you to do something for your noggin here. I need you to improve your knowledge level. Listen, you got to be able to walk in talking structures. You've got to be able to walk in and say, here, on my left vulva, whatever, whatever. You've got to, you got to know where things are located. You got to be able to say, hey, it's my left piriformis muscle. Hey, I think my pudendal nerve might be being compromised or, you know, being pressed on because I've got this weird sensation. Uh, and so come on over to our website, icnetwork at mac.com. I took down my sign. Rated number one in the world. Most accurate, reliable website by... Harvard Medical School and the University of London in two peer-reviewed research studies. This is my doctoral dissertation proposal for bringing support to patients who were homebound back in 1994, which ironically I could not do because I couldn't sit in a car and go anywhere for five years because my heart pain hurt so bad. But it's uh, I'm really quite delighted that my little doctoral dissertation proposal ended up becoming 27 years later on the most reliable and accurate website on IC, at least I think it is. Trudy says, I'm a simple RN and I admire your patience. <laughs> Thank you. I, you know, guys, listen, suffering is, suffer. there's nothing worse than having something, you know, you gotta understand that I, did, I didn't just do this for other people, I did this for me. Number one, I was lonely. You know, I was driving to work crying I couldn't understand why I was in so much pain. My doctor didn't know what the hell was wrong with me. I was despondent. I was feeling like I was being punished, you know, lots of things like that. And I was in a deep, deep circle of despair. And it wasn't until some of the first research studies came out, which showed the genetic connection. And it was like, oh, wait a second. It's not my fault. Wait, no, my, my sister has this. Wait, it's not my fault. My my sister has this. I mean, I didn't do anything wrong. I always thought I'd done something wrong. I always thought I was being punished. My mother has this. My grandmother had this. Oh, wait, wait, really? I didn't do this? That was a critical moment for me to be able to take the self-blame away. It was, a, it was a monkey on my back. I was extremely depressed over it. And there was a great freedom in being able to say, you know what? I'm hurt. I got hurt. I got hurt. No blame, no shame. And, and to be able to, you know, like the best part of my job is to talk to somebody, especially younger people who are in their twenties or teens who are carrying that shame. I want to say to them what I needed somebody to say to me, and that is you haven't done anything wrong. This is not your fault in any way, shape or form. You are a beautiful person. Life, it, you know, life is worth living. Life is worth exploring. Let's see if we can figure this out. Give you, give your health back so you can go out and follow your dreams. I want you to be able to follow your dreams. Listen, your last homework for the day is for 15 minutes. I need you to laugh. 
Seriously. Now look at my room. Do you see my room here behind me? This is a happy place. This is not a sad room. This is a happy room. I deliberately surround myself with things which make me smile. And you will see, I have my favorite sign right there that says believe, believe in the future. I love my love sign. I love my love sign. I have winged things everywhere. If you could see, I've got a massive amount of butterflies hanging off my, uh, my, my lamp right here. It is important to fill your, fill your life and space with things that make you smile. And I don't want you sitting in a dark room with the windows closed. You got to open up the windows and let the light shine in, babes. You got to let the light shine in. Power positivity. If you keep thinking that, this, that you know, the world is going to end and you're always going to have pain, you're giving your brain something to focus on. I need your brain to focus on something good. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But insert your faith. Every day in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. Be bold. My favorite one of all, my favorite affirmation is be bold and mighty forces shall come to thy aid. Whatever force that would be, whatever faith you have. Be bold. You know, when I started the IC Network, I... Now, granted, I already had a lot of degrees and I'd already been a presidential fellow and, and, and I'm a fairly bold person anyway. Man, I just picked up the phone call and called people. I called researchers. Be bold. If you're not getting help from your local doctor, be bold. If you've got one of the top doctors in the nation a couple hours from you, be bold. Call them. You deserve the best. If you're not getting help from a local doctor and you've been there for 10 years and you're not getting better, the American Urology Association says, take a step back and revisit the diagnosis. Maybe I'll miss something. Maybe you have pelvic congestion syndrome. Do you feel like as you are, uh, as, as you go through the day that you're carrying, that you get this weight in your belly and it gets heavier and heavier and heavier until at the end of the day, you feel like you're carrying a bowling ball around in your pelvis? And you're peeing all the time? Well, you know what that is? That's pelvic congestion syndrome. That's fixable easily, easily. And so this is about ruling lots of stuff out. Be bold, ask for help. David Bauman says, why do you have the birdcage? Because I think it's pretty. My aunt gave it to me like 20 years ago. It's totally my style. I'm a fairy girl. I like fairies and butterflies and things like that. And, and you can see I've got cats up there too. I just, you know, I tend to be kind of ethereal. That's kind of my style, romantic ethereal, except for the, uh, the skeleton <laughs> in front of it. All right, guys, any last questions? Any last questions? Otherwise, I'm going to go walk around a little bit. Marion, that's why. I, oh, yeah. Marion says, I feel like I'm not. You, you, none of you are alone, hon. You're not. You know, don't you just wait for the day. I cannot wait for the day that I get to hug so many of you the next time there is a conference. Now, listen, that's going to be a couple years away. And I'm getting older now. <laughs> so you're going to see an old lady eventually when that happens, although I'm very young at heart. But um you know, we are in this together. And speaking of being in this together, guys, we have IC Awareness Month coming. Uh, please go to icawareness.org and learn how you can do it. I, I, I still haven't even written the press release because I'm dealing with fires here. I'm, I'm trying my best. I'm going to try to get a press release out tonight, to, tonight or tomorrow, but the light bulb just wasn't turning up for me um, with respect to a really good um, press release for it. But I see Awareness Month is all about you guys doing stuff. It's just going to be, in my opinion, sub subdued this year. So uh, uh, you, we're still going to have the poster contest. We're still going to have the meme contest. I uh, haven't turned the doctor nominations on yet. Just haven't had time. Um, but that's going to be a, a, at least the limit of my participation. So I hope you will pick up, pick up the mantle 
and kick some butt and let's educate some people on IC this year. All right, I see one more question here on YouTube. How do you fix your bladder? How do you fix bladder floor congestion? Con oh, pelvic floor congestion. Well, so when you have pelvic floor congestion, pelvic floor congestion, that's the equivalent of varicose veins in your in your pelvis. It means that either veins or the veins have swollen and they're holding more blood. And so they it's a they um, just fix the blood vessel. And there's a couple of different ways they do it. And it's it's really very easy. Um, so I have an article on it in our last magazine uh, or, where you can uh, order that magazine and see that or just Google it. Pelvic floor congestion. It's very easy to fix. So, all right, guys. Hey, let me uh, 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 let me just hold on one sec. Let, let me just, God, I wish I could share my screen on Facebook. I was going to show you guys. Hold on a sec. Let me see if I can do this. I would love to share my screen. Nope. Nope. Well, anyway, um, I will give updates on uh, the fires too. And, and please send prayers our way. We really, really, really do need it. And please don't move to California. We all want to leave California right now because it's all burning up. So, <laughs> and I'm not lying. Question is where the hell to go? That's the problem. So I will see you guys later. Have a good one. All right. Goodbye, Facebook. See ya. All right, YouTube. Got eight more people on YouTube. All right, you guys. I will see you later. Have a good one. I wish you the best. Have a great week.